Tim. Kasai. Two oddly shaped bodies stumbled toward the main gate of the Monastery of Ordo. One was the size of a young boy and walked with a hitched step. The other was a monstrosity with a massive upper torso, two heads, and what appeared to be multiple arms and legs. Both were silhouetted by the sun. The warning gong was struck four times. One of the wall sentries pointed to the approaching figures. There, do you see that? A second shouted from the wall to the monks gathered in the courtyard. It's Brother Kasai. He's with Brother Maru and Brother Hundu. The younglings are hurt. Bring help. Kasai was relieved to see the gates open, and brothers were rushing out to meet him. His back and legs ached from carrying Hondo. Maru kept pace at his side and offered whatever support he could. Kasai heard faint cheering coming from the monks overhead as he stumbled through the gateway into the safety of Ordu. Hans grabbed his robe and kept him upright. His brothers gently took Hondo from his back and laid him on the ground. Kasai put his arm around Maru's shoulder and guided him to a nearby bench. We're home now. No more worry, Kasai said. He closed his eyes and exhaled. His back was stiff from fatigue. His legs trembled as if chilled from being out in the snow too long. Monks raced toward them with stretchers. Maru and Hondo were carted off to the infirmary. Brother Nabu offered Kasai a cup of water from a nearby rain barrel. Kasai drank down his fill. His mouth was already dry again when he handed the empty cup back. Another, please. Should I bring you the entire barrel next time? Nabu said as he handed a fresh cup to Kasai. You certainly deserve it. Daku said you fell with the younglings. He told everyone you were lost. I'm glad to see you're all in one piece. A frown stole across Kasai's face for just a moment, and then he forced a smile. Happy to be in one piece, brother, Kasai replied. He gulped down the second cup of cold rain water. Water never tasted so good. He leaned back on the bench. I see you still carry the weight of the brotherhood on your shoulders, Nabu said. I'm tired. Uh-oh, here comes Brother Mano. He is wearing the white robes this month. Oh, hide me, Kasai said half-heartedly. Mano had pulled the duty of Master's Messenger. He bowed respectfully, but his face was all business. Brother Kasai, the Masters would like a word with you. They wait for you in the Chamber of Reflection. All of them? Kasai asked. I'm afraid so, Mano said. Looks like you're not done yet, Nabu said. Kasai's spirit fell. What would it be now? A full season of midnight watch on the North Ridge? Various punishments rifled through his head, none of them pleasant. His legs hurt, his back hurt. He was tired, hungry, and just wanted to sleep. Kasai reluctantly rose. He headed for the Chamber of Reflection. Daku must have said something about disobeying his direct orders. He was sure to receive a severe reprimand by Master Dore. Daku would never let him live this down. Kasai entered the hall containing the Chamber of Reflection. He walked hesitantly down a long wooden corridor. The walls of the hallway were covered with ancient scrolls. Each one was filled with colorful images depicting the great deeds and sacrifices of legendary monks from Ordu. Jen Mo was given the first scroll, as was his due. He had the honor of being the first ever hero of Aetanos. He was shown fighting against demons from the abyss. His holy sword, Azern, blazed bright red. Next to Jen Mol was Aetanos, who wielded Ninsis Zida. The weapon segments spun in a blue swirl of fire. Kasai felt a profound appreciation for the history of Ordu. His trial on the mountain had shown him some of the reality of those feats. Maybe he would one day have a scroll made in his honor. He shook his head. Pfft, who was he kidding? He was no hero. He was just a stupid monk. Kasai arrived at the door to the Chamber of Reflection. The door was already open. Beeswax candles cast a dim orange glow through the room. The delicate smell of sweet honey and aged wood filled the space. The three masters of order waited inside. Kasai took a deep breath and gathered his thoughts. He knew they would ask him to explain his conduct on the mountain. That coup had earned the right to command. That was the rule. He should not have gone against his captain's orders, but he couldn't forsake the younglings. Brother Kasai, it will be difficult to talk if you remain outside. Please come in, Master Kunshin said from inside the chamber. Yes, Master, Kasai hurried into the room. We are happy to see you have returned to Ordu. I hope your overnight stay on the mountain was a pleasant one. His eyes crinkled and sparkled with amusement. Kasai bowed to each master before he spoke. 
Yes, Master Kunshin. We were humbled by the hospitality of the Great Mountain. She graciously provided us with a small nook to take shelter against the rains. I secured Brother Hondo's leg with a basic rock splint, but I fear it will need to be reset. When the rain ceased, we scaled the wall as one. Brother Maru is quite skilled when he puts his mind to it. Kasai smiled. He remembered where he was and why and made his face blank. Tell me, did you discover your path to the boundless? Master Shoker said. He traced a design in the air that only his blind eyes could see. Then he blew it forward. Kasai thought he saw the soft glow of candlelight on the master's body grow brighter. He rubbed his eyes. When he opened them, a faint blue image floated in the air toward him. It was the same design the master had drawn in the air. I'm so tired, he thought. I'm starting to see things. Kasai rubbed his eyes again for good measure. The boundless did not fully reveal itself to me, Master Shoker, but it provided what was necessary when it was needed most. Kasai bowed respectfully after answering the question. Know that the boundless interacts with us all as individuals. It is a path that you will travel alone, for the boundless accept us as ourselves in total as we are added to its whole. But you must have faith if you wish to succeed, said Master Shoker. Faith in a wandering demigod that has vanished from the lands, or an unseen goddess who has created the world of misery and suffering, Master? Kasai immediately regretted what he said. He would receive a double dose of punishment for sure. No, nothing so dramatic as that. You must have faith in yourself. No otherworldly being controls our actions or determines our fate. They merely point us in a direction based on influence. We do the rest. Brother Kasai, Master Dorhe said in a stern voice, we have discussed at length your actions on the mountain and their consequences. Yes, Master Dorhe, I understand, said Kasai. He bowed once more and stood straight. He was ready to accept whatever punishment the master saw fit to give him for disobeying Daku's orders. Master Dorhe continued, On the morrow you shall receive the mark of Ohur, a shield against the outer elements. It will ward you for a time against the frigid cold of the deepest lake and the fiery embrace of the burning pyre. Also, we will mark you with mizzen, to fill the hearts of those around you with the courage you possess. As you are strong of will, so shall you inspire the will of others. That is all. You may take your rest. Kasai was stunned. He stood dumbfounded for long moments. Brother Kasai, Master Dorhe said. Kasai humbly bowed before each of the masters and left the chamber of reflection. He wondered if he had heard correctly. Instead of receiving a reprimand, he was being rewarded. He would figure it out after he had rested. He was exhausted. Kasai opened his eyes to a room filled with sunlight. It was already the following morning when he rose from his cot. The masters had let him sleep throughout the day and night. He was famished. Kasai realized he had missed dawn chores and morning meditation. Maybe he could still get a bit of warm bread to eat before calisthenics and sparring. Kasai left his small room and went outside. He saw Daku across the courtyard. Daku, wait, he shouted. Daku turned fast. His face was an angry mask of betrayal. Leave me be. I want nothing to do with you. You have ruined my honor. The master's look at me is something broken. Let me explain, Kasai implored. Daku grabbed Kasai's forearm and held it up to his face. When you get branded with Ohur and Mizen later today, remember that you stole them from me. Brother, it wasn't like that. Daku stepped uncomfortably close to Kasai. How could I have been so blind? I have always carried you during the tournaments. I see now you've always been jealous. Daku squeezed Kasai's forearm. He had a grip as secure as a steel trap. You meant to humiliate me and undermine my authority. You and the two younglings were in it together, and Jureska and Shiro as well. Spittle flew from Daku's mouth and his face was bright red. You all wanted me to fail, but I won't. Now that I know of your betrayal, I will be prepared next time. I will show you what it means to betray me. Kasai broke away from Daku's handhold. Brother, none of what you say is true. I did not mean for the masters to strip you of your leadership. I said nothing of what happened. They already knew. Of course they knew. Everyone here is a rat. Except for Kasai. He's a hero. I'm no hero, brother. No, you're not. And stop calling me that. I am not your brother. You are just like the rest. You have betrayed our friendship. We're finished. 
The coup marched away. The coup, wait! Kasai wished he could think of something to say that would quench the fire Zindu burning through his friend, but Daku was caught up in his wild passion. It would be best to wait until he was calm and at peace. Kasai strolled to the kitchens. He wondered if he had lost his best friend. Kasai left the refectory with a roll of bread dipped in honey. The earlier scuffle with Daku had mostly been forgotten. Kasai had no control of his brother's emotions and therefore decided to let go of his guilt. The two friends had tenuous moments in the past. Eventually, they would find common ground together. The mountain air was clean and crisp from the early autumn rains. The sky was the color of everlasting blue and morning dew glistened in the yard. Kasai heard small mountain birds chirping their happiness at the start of a new day. He sighed with contentment. He enjoyed the simple routine of his days. He was well suited to a structure and ordered life, notwithstanding his consistent tardiness. But who among his brothers was perfect? The way of Udo challenged his mind in the same way his body worked through handholds and kicks. It required complete focus, dedication, and practice. The monks of the four orders spent their lives seeking to perfect the execution of each unique doctrine of their order. The order of Udo focused on the understanding and use of Zindu energy. The masters continually pushed the monks to develop their inner connection to the elemental forces of water, fire, earth, air, and spirit. In this way, they learned to manipulate the vibrations of energy flowing through their bodies. Mastery demanded deep concentration. When done correctly, a monk could achieve miraculous feats. This was the way of Urdu. When you master the ability to control the depth of your concentration, you will understand the boundaries of self and non-self. This is the key to understanding the boundless, Master Shoker had said. Kasai excelled at the intellectual understanding of the Zindu mysteries. Unfortunately, he was a poor student compared to his brothers when using the strange gift in his daily life. He was told Zindu energy was the primordial force that gave life to the world and mastering one's internal energy was part of the boundless. It was a big part. That didn't matter to Kasai. It seemed unnatural to him. Using Zendo energy felt like wielding dark magic. He didn't trust it. That's probably why the boundless seems so very far away from me, Kasai said as he walked to the central square. He kicked a pebble in the courtyard. At least the bread was good. He entered the central square just as his brothers moved into the sparring circles to fight against one another. Some were lone defenders against multiple attackers, while others faced only a single adversary. The masters watched and instructed. The monks changed positions when each match reached its conclusion. Brother Ori, let's match up, Kasai said. Sure, Ori said. They bowed once and then began. Within a few exchanges, Ori was on his back. Kasai reached down to help his brother up. Your strike combinations are becoming more fluid, Ori. It looks like you have been doing some extra practicing with the new technique. Kasai gave Ori a friendly pat on the back. I need all the practice I can get. These advanced techniques are getting more difficult to perform, Ori said. Yet you make it look so easy. You need only let go of what you think you must do and focus on what fills its place. Has Master Shogart taught you to speak in riddles as well? Do I really sound like him? Both young monks paused a moment to reflect and then laughed. They resumed their positions opposite one another, bowed, and began again. I heard the masters are looking for the next couple to the junior brothers, Ori said. You would be perfect. I know. They asked before we left to repair the Dawn Bridge. I respectfully declined. You declined the masters? Ori was stunned. Why? You are one of the best fighters at Urdu. The brothers look up to you. You're a natural leader. Let's face it, Kasai, you already talk like one of them. They both laughed again. I think Daku is more interested in taking on the responsibilities of being Kapu, Kasai said. He's better suited for that role. Are you crazy, Daku? He left you, Hondo, and Maru on the mountain to die. Who does that to their brothers? Daku was only looking out for the safety of the group. Kasai brushed some ground debris from his shirt. He looked over to where Daku was sparring with another brother. The fight had its typical outcome. But Daku dominated his opponent with ease. Why must you always defend him? How did he earn such loyalty from you? You don't understand him. His life before order was harder than most of us. He'll change, Kasai said, hopefully. You'll see. We've all had bad weather in our past, brother. For most of us, being here was the best option. 
Yes, we've all been through something. Kasai thought about his younger days, darker days. Kasai, you owe it to us younger monks to be Kapu. If nothing else, you would prevent Daku from breaking our backs. Ori, I think I would only let you down. I can best serve the Brotherhood by following rather than leading. The ego leads, the servant follows, and through his service, more are helped. I am content with my role. You'll leave us to the whims of that bully? Watch him now, you'll see. Ori pointed to where Daku was sparring. A new match had started. Daku stepped into the sparring circle. He faced off against four junior brothers. They immediately circled him. Each sought a weakness they could exploit, but they took on different attacking styles to prevent Daku from mounting a proper defense. Daku rotated counter to their movements. He assessed each of his adversaries, then launched himself at Brother Lo. He was small, about the same height as Kasai. Daku grabbed a handful of Lo's loose shirt and brought up his knee hard. It connected with Lo's midsection. Brother Miri rushed him. Daku smoothly pivoted to his right and sent his heel to Miri's jaw. Lo and Mary were done. They dropped to the dusty ground at the same time. Kasai could see the fear in the body language of the two remaining brothers. Daku was in his element. He reveled in having power over others. Kasai saw Brother Jonah and Brother Nico contemplated the next moves carefully. Daku took advantage of their hesitation and launched into the air with a spinning hammer kick. His heel slammed down on Nico's shoulder. The young monk cried out in pain. The force of the blow must have shattered his collarbone. Daku spun in the opposite direction and delivered a second kick to Nico's handsome face. His nose exploded with blood and he crumbled to the ground. Daku left him crying in the dirt. Brother Jonah did his best to shore up his defense. Daku threw a flurry of punches at him, which eventually broke down Jonah's guard. Three quick strikes to the face and Jonah was on his knees. Daku had systematically incapacitated four junior brothers with ease. His form was perfect and his swiftness of movement was astonishing. Daku strikes to hurt, not to disarm, Ori said. He wins because he instills fear in his opponents. Those four are better fighters against anyone else. Because I watched as Daku celebrated his victory. He felt ashamed for his brother's exuberance. I'm the best! I'm the best! Daku pumped his fist in the air. He looked around to see if anyone else had watched his match. Kasai and Ori edged closer to where the three masters stood. They had watched the bout with great interest. Kasai knew he shouldn't eavesdrop. His curiosity got the better of him, and he listened anyway. Bitterness and loneliness filled the young man's heart. The bad memories of his youth fueled his fires into to dangerous levels. He must learn to control his rage, or he will become a problem, Master Dory said. The walls protecting his garden go high. They shield the seeds of his fear with resentment. The flowers he grows will be ill-formed if you cannot help him, Master Shoker said. Too great is his unwillingness to embrace in the boundless. The openness is close to him. He refuses to share equally of himself with the world around him. Never formless is this one. He remains Daku at all times, Master Kunshin said. The best, the best. Hmm. What is best? What is worst? Perhaps they are the same with our young monk. He hides much of himself in secret places. Maybe he had found a different path to the boundless, unique only to him, Master Shogar said. Let us present Brother Daku with the light of a different target. We will see what we can retrieve from the shadows of his anger. The blind master walked to the sparring circle where Daku stood victorious. Master Shuya bowed deferentially to the young monk. You may use any weapon of your choice, Brother Daku. I shall rely solely on the boundless and use what is offered. Kasai and Ori looked at each other with apparent surprise. Masters did not spar with junior or even senior monks. It would be as if a champion knight chose to joust against a horseless peasant. Kasai could imagine what Daku was thinking. He would be eager to pit his skill against Master Shogar. Defeating a master in one-on-one -on -one combat would ensure he regained his honor. It would be dishonorable to use a weapon against you, Master Shorger, when you have none, Daku said. Kasai shook his head in disbelief. That was a mistake. As you wish, Master Shogar said. Let us begin. The two monks faced each other and bowed. Daku conclusively demonstrated a series of complex movements that convey the different offensive styles he had already mastered. He was ready. Master Shogar remained calm and still. 
Naku's leg flashed low. He sought to sweep the master's legs from under him. Master showed here was a blur of motion. Naku spun in a complete circle. He had stopped where he had started, but was left off balance. Daku crouched as best he could. He scanned for the master. Master Shoyer tapped Daku on the back of his shoulder and sent him to the ground in obvious pain. Daku looked up in astonishment. Master Shoyer simply smiled and patiently waited for Daku to recover. Daku grimaced as he got to his feet. He rolled his shoulder and did his best to relax his muscles. He then struck out with a powerful punch of his own. Master Shoyer pivoted to the side, and Daku's strike found empty air. Master Shoker touched Daku's outstretched arm with two fingers to the deltoid. Daku's arm fell limp at his side. Daku attacked with a reverse kick and found himself on the ground again. He scurried forward to grapple with Master Shoker. Daku's good hand shot out to grab the master's pant leg, but missed. Daku was angry and frustrated. Some of the brothers snickered under their breath. They were enjoying the payback. Daku leapt to his feet and scowled at the crowd. He launched into a furious and undisciplined attack. Don't lose yourself to your fury. You must control your fires into as you do all things passing through you, Master Shoker said. His words were calm and soothing. I am strongest with my fires into blazing. Daku punched out again and followed the leaping kick. The master deflected both blows with his outstretched hand. It was the only weapon he used during the entire match. Daku kicked a second time. Master Shoker grabbed the foot and twisted it around. Daku twirled in the air before he hit the ground hard. Guide your passion, young one. Be at peace with your Zindu, or you are lost. I am not lost, master. Daku spit dirt from his mouth. He managed to stand, barely. With great effort, he raised the arm that Master Shoyard had paralyzed earlier. I can still fight. Kasai could see the focus was lost from Daku's eyes. His upper body swayed on weak legs. No, this match has reached its conclusion, Master Shoger said. Brother Daku collapsed back to the ground. He could hear his brothers mock him. Stop laughing, he said. There is a lesson here, my son. Have you discovered it? Daku looked up at Master Shoker. Exasperation was written across his face. As you say, Master, I must learn to control my fires into energy. That is partially correct. But the higher truth of the Zindu mysteries still eludes you. Zindu energy fuels much more than merely your martial prowess. It will influence the creation or the destruction of your higher purpose. When you silence your passion, you will see the many options available to you on your path of life, instead of running blindly down the one you currently travel. What else have you learned? I hoped I was your equal, but I was wrong. You're stronger, faster, more skilled than me. No, that is not the lesson of today. This is not where you stumbled. Your eyes are open, but are still blind to the higher world around you. You fail to grasp the totality of the boundless, and so you remain a crude weapon. Master Shuria walked a few steps in contemplation, then continued. You maintain boundaries where there are none. You are always, Daku. You hold tight to your identity, but it serves only to prevent you from openness. You must learn to let go of the self if you are to be one with the boundless. Contemplate openness during your meditations, my young monk. Tomorrow is another day to grow. I will do as you say, master. I am humbled by your skill and thankful for your wisdom. Daku bowed low to Master Shoker. The lunchtime bell chimed in the background and the monks made their way to the refractory. Kasai watched his friend intently. Daku was not known to exhibit humility or acceptance of defeat so readily. Perhaps this was a new beginning for his friend. Unfortunately, when Daku rose, there was bitterness written across his face. Nothing had changed. Perhaps it never would. But something Master Shogar had said to Daku resonated with Kasai. You maintain boundaries where there are none. Kasai knew the same could be said for him. But something inside him was working to bring down those walls. It started when he faced the trial of pillars and became more pronounced on the mountainside. It was as if a small space had opened in his mind. Or maybe it was there before, but he had never noticed. Kasai hoped it meant he was taking his first step to become one with the boundless. The voice in his head spoke to him frequently, but mostly it whispered twisted words Kasai did not understand. That was worrisome. He said nothing about it to Maru or Hondo when they were sequestered on the mountainside together. He hid it again from the masters in the chamber of reflection as well. He was unsure what it meant. 
He feared if he expressed himself to the masters, they would fill him with more riddles. No, this was something he needed to figure out for himself. But how? Kasai had a stupid idea. He walked in the direction of the pillars. I must not fear this test. If what I hear is truly my connection to the boundless, I shall hear it again, Kasai said. Either that or I am going as mad as the voice in my head. He closed his mind from the noise of conflicting thoughts. He would be calm and let the fear subside. He was eager to see the higher world of the boundless. Kasai removed his sandals. He placed them neatly to the side of the first pillar. The first step was just as easy to take as before. The stone felt cold and hard against his bare feet. Kasai stepped to the next pillar, and the next. This isn't too bad, he said. It took the pillars at a run, and soon he was high above the ground, and the air temperature suddenly dropped. The pillars became shrouded in mist, and a claustrophobic fear crept up his spine. He didn't want to take the next leap. Just be calm. The voice will come. The winds picked up, and the pillars swayed gracefully under him. No reassuring message came to mind. The voice was silent. What was he doing here? He had purposely put himself in a dangerous situation, thinking he was special. He wasn't touched by something special. That hard truth pounded in his head like a hammer against a dense stone. He swiveled around. Maybe he could go back. He saw only swirling mists. The pillar top behind him was lost from sight. Can't go that way. A quick gust of air pushed him close to the edge of the pillar. He stumbled while trying to maintain his balance. His back foot slid off the top. His body dropped first to one knee and then over the side. His hand shot out and grabbed the crest of the pillar. He quickly wrapped his thumb over his fingers to solidify the grip. Kasai dangled in the white air bumping against the post. It was a long way down, even with the safety nets. Wait, were they up? He had forgotten to check. His heart thumped in his chest, and the sweat of fear covered his body. Where are you when I need you? Kasai said into the empty air. Have you abandoned me as well? Trust, came the voice in a whisper. Calm. Concentrate. Kasai listened to the message echoing in his thoughts, and he calmed his fear. He concentrated his efforts on regaining purchase on the pillar top. Once there, Kasai sat with his legs hooked around the column for support. He recited mantras to relax his body and mind. Eventually, his breathing came slow and even. He could feel the relaxed rhythm of his chest expanding with air and then deflating as he released it. Look. Kasai fixed his sight to a point in space where he suspected the next pillar to be. He stared intently at the same spot as moments stretched into minutes. Something was happening. He could see small particles of moisture floating in the air before his eyes. He felt each tiny droplet as it touched his skin. Kasai held his hand in front of his face. He could barely see it through the thick mist. He focused more intently on the particles of moisture that separated from the air. They swirled around his hand in a shimmering blue haze. The moisture moved past his hand as a river flowed around boulders impeding its course. The flow was hardly discernible, but it was there. Kasai saw a map of what was and what was not. What dark magic is this? He lost his focus. The impenetrable air returned to blanket his sight, and his hand disappeared. Safe, the voice said. Kasai sighed. Okay, okay. Hesitantly, he sought the division between the water and the air. What else was out there? Where was the sun, the clouds, the birds? Kasai's heartbeat slowed. His mind became silent. His breathing was even. Show me the river that flows. Where are the rocks that are not the river? Kasai saw trails of swirling blue flow around a long line of shadowy shapes. He saw the next pillar. It was so close he would barely need to jump. Kasai leaped and landed squarely on its top. He jumped again, and again. It was as easy as walking in broad strides. Pillars finally descended. He cleared the mist layer and eventually stepped from the last pillar onto soft grass. He felt each blade of grass underfoot. His toes dug into the soil. It felt warm, even though the grass was cool. The mist was gone but he could still see the currents of moisture flowing around whatever he saw. 
Kasai suddenly became anxious. He had completed what he should not have been able to accomplish. He turned back to see the marble pillars winding up into the air behind him. A giddy feeling of unease filled his gut. He didn't know if he was going to cheer or vomit. What have I done? An interesting question, said a voice approaching from across the lawn. Kasai turned to see Master Sugar walking toward him. He saw a wisp of yellow flash over the master's head. It was reminiscent of what Kasai saw when he was in the chamber of infection with the three masters. He focused his attention on the color, and it blossomed into golden glow around his teacher. Kasai bowed to Master Shogar. You have passed the trial of pillars, my son, Master Shogar said. An impossible challenge for one of your level of training. This is a curious thing. But for now, I am wondering what led you to such a bold endeavor when the safety nets were not in place. Because I'm an idiot, Kasai thought. Master, please forgive my rashness. I'm not sure how to explain my actions, but it was something I had to do. Indulge me in an attempt, Master Shogar said. He stroked his beard and mustache, which he was fond of doing. Master, there has been a voice with me since my first attempt ascending the pillars. I heard it again on the mountain. Maybe I've heard it for many years, but just not as clear. It says little, but directs my thoughts and actions. Interesting. One would welcome such a helpful guide. Yet you sound distraught. At first, I thought I was getting closer to understanding the boundless. But now, my word fell magic has befallen me. The voice guides me and shows me things I shouldn't know, that no one should know. Ah... Perhaps you hear the song of Aetnos. I thought that was only a myth, something created to bolster the legend of the great monk. This does not surprise me, Master Shogar said. Brother Kasai, you have always excelled in your studies of Aetnos, but a deeper belief in your patron seems to be missing. When you first arrived at Ordu, you could recite many of the stories before they were told to you. My father told me stories of Aetnos when I was very young, before... Kasai became silent. Before coming to the monastery? Yes, master. Please sit with me a moment. Kasai sat down next to Master Shou. They both looked to the majestic vista of the mountain range. The sky was clear and blue. Kasai wondered what had happened to the mist surrounding the pillars. Was it all just something he created in his head? There is great hesitancy to your actions. It was evident in the tournament bout against Brother Daku and it is even more profound in acceptance of the Zindu mysteries. Your overall spiritual progression is slow. I trust you and the other masters, of course. I think I trust in the boundless, though at times it seems extremely far from me. And what of Aetinus, my son? How does he fit into your understanding of all that is around you? I'm not sure, master. Things were much simpler when I was a little boy. The people of my small village followed his light. He was our guide, and my father was a devoted follower. Everyone looked up to him. He was a hero. But then the dark things came. I was abandoned when I needed him most. How could that happen, Master? How could he allow so much misery to fall upon his faithful? Where was the hero when he was needed most? Are you referring to Aetanos or your father, Brother Kasai? Kasai did not respond. He had often searched for answers to that question. The connection between Aetanos and his father always ended in the same way, a dead end. It appeared Master Shoyer had read his thoughts. For each of us, the answers to such questions remain hidden until we are ready to accept the truth. But isn't Aetanos supposed to be the protector of his faithful? Yes, of course. At times, Aetanos himself is the divine hammer that smites the darkness. Other times... He is the forge unto which his avatars are created. The souls of his chosen become tempered through his trials. The process can be brutal, but eventually the metal in their hearts become unbreakable. They are his ever heroes. Kasai thought about what Master Shoyer said, then realized he was frowning. Kasai searched the expansive sky surrounding the snow-capped mountains for answers to his unasked questions. He spotted a lone crest eagle climbing for warmer air drafts as it used its strength to gain altitude and then soared with outstretched wings atop the airstreams. Its bright orange feathers were golden in the yellow sunlight. 
The eagle cried out as it snatched a smaller bird out of the sky. The crest eagle is with us, Master Shorya said. Perhaps the great bird is here now to help you along in your pensive journey. Perhaps, Master. Brother Kasai, are you familiar with the legend of the fire serpent? You speak of the great artifact, Ninsis Zira. I know that it is a three-sectioned staff. Yes, that's right. But do you know of the unique characteristics of the weapon? Some stories say Atenos created Ninsis Zira during the frost war against the devil Sekka, but it was lost. Other stories tell how Atenos gave Ninsis Zira to Genmol before he ascended to the seven heavens. I have read that the fire serpent is a bane against evil. It has traveled through the centuries, wielded by heroes of old seeking to destroy the minions for the deep dark. Other texts said that Ninza Seed is a damned thing with a mind of its own. It seeks to possess the soul of its wielder and make him or her its slave. You have studied the scrolls well, Master Shoker said. And do you have thoughts of your own concerning the fire serpent? Would you welcome the opportunity to wield her in battle? Me? Certainly not. I am not worthy of any weapon forged by Aethanos. Kasai was amused at the idea. <laughs> no, no, I I'm not a hero. Leave that weapon to the likes of Daku. You believe Brother Daku to be a more likely candidate for Ninsis Zira? Well, he certainly has a great desire for battle and a healthy supply of fire, Zindu. Perhaps he could control the fire serpent and not become possessed by the staff. Interesting that you would say such a thing. There is no doubt the fire serpent commands respect. However, she seeks to belong to something greater than herself. She is incomplete without a greater power to wield her. The other masters and I have noticed your proficiency in the use of the mundane Sanjiku, a weapon of similar size and design to the fire serpent. There has been a debate on introducing you to the Ninza Sida. The weapon chooses its own, mind you. I am unworthy, Master. Surely there is another more qualified. Kasai wasn't sure how or why this was being discussed. He was no champion to wield such a weapon, and he did not want to be one. Kasai was content to be a simple monk. He changed the subject. You keep referring to Ninza Zida as a she, Master. Why? Master Shogar remained silent for a moment, then spoke. We shall talk more of this later. For now... You must remember, one must seek to be whole, not perfect. Now, news of your accomplishment will travel fast. Do not think these blind eyes were the only ones to see such foolishness. You had best prepare your answers for the questions to come. Master Shogar gave Kasai a tender smile. Thank you for your wise counsel, Master Shogar. I shall meditate on the mysteries of Atenos and his relationship to us all, and prepare for a lot of unwanted attention. Kasai returned Master Shogar's smile and somehow knew the elderly monk felt it. Kasai excused himself and walked away in silence. Yes, he recited the mantras of eight and with the rest of his brothers, but he did not fully accept the message of hope they conveyed. How could he? While he was sequestered in the safety of order, the nightmares of the real world preyed upon the weak. Periodically, traveling monks returned to order to discuss the events happening throughout the three kingdoms. The lands outside the monastery walls could be a cruel place. This is precisely why the message of Athenos was so important. All things have their balance. We must act as the counterweight to the darker side of the human spirit. We must become the beacon of light which reveals the path of goodness within all of us, Master Kunshin had said. Daku had a different philosophy. The strong fist prevails over the tender heart. He only believed in the power of his own hands and not the rambling of a crazed monk, long dead. Daku was always at odds with everyone. Kasai wondered if he could make a difference in the real world. It all seemed so far away. He just wanted to belong somewhere, as he did in a small village. He wanted to have a home and be at peace. Life and order was something he could believe in and protect. This is where I belong. Ordo is my home now. Yet for all Ordo had to offer... Kasai still felt empty inside. Something was missing. He wished he had more faith, but sadly it did not come to him as effortlessly as it did for the others. Master Shogar was right. He was incomplete. There was fear in his heart that traveled with him like a second shadow. He feared being left behind and alone. He feared to fail those who counted on him to keep them safe, 
just like his father had done. No, he would not be the one who ran from danger. He would not follow in his father's footsteps. He would be different. He vowed then to protect those he loved. That would be his truth. 11. Seca. Seca was the perfection of beauty and seduction in her human form. She was tall, curvaceous, and slender, and possessed a glamour that stimulated desire in all who beheld her. She had been known to stir many a man to do impossibly wicked things, and the female slave she devoured could not help but be drawn to her womanhood before they bet their fates. She was the dark side of desire. She was strength. She was chaos. The witches and warlocks in her coven were drawn to her power. They craved just a morsel of the magic she possessed. Those lucky enough to win her favor would experience a touch of deep magic normally, reserved only for those born of devilish blood. It would destroy them over time, but they willingly accepted the gift. Anything for more power, even if it was fleeting. Seca was something far different in her abyssal form. She was a monstrous nightmare to behold with a body that was both dense and formidable. Coarse white fur blanketed her back in thick clumps. Four curling horns framed her head, and a crown of bones embedded with onyx stones at its base hovered above her head as smoky sigils of power rose through its center. Four hooked teeth jutted from her full mouth, which gnashed together in delight when she tore the souls for her human slaves. She squatted at the center of an inverted, cone-shaped pit. The walls of the hole were slick with ice. Human soul slaves frantically scurried over one another like rats fleeing a flooded hollow. The howling winds of the wastelands of Thresh shrieked overhead, which added to the sweet melody of their suffering. Her avian legs ended in great talons. She could grasp five grown men at once and rip them to shreds. Even lowered on her legs as she was, she towered ten feet above the pit's floor. The steaming blood and innards of the dead covered her chest and stomach like a thick apron of red and brown sludge. Her black within black eyes scanned the delicious banquet before her. A hundred human slaves frantically climbed the slick sides of the outwardly sloping pit. They tore savagely at one another in desperation. The slaves pulled back the heads of their fellows by yanking handfuls of hair. Eyeballs were gouged out, and necks were throttled mercilessly. They climbed higher and higher, using each other to build a ladder to freedom. This was how she played with her toys. Escape the pit and live. That was the game. Slaves already on the slippery floor dashed about like mice. They battled each other to gain purchase on the highest rung of the human ladder. None cared that the cost of their freedom was the souls of their brethren. The longer the game played out, the more soul slaves would be devoured, causing the height of the human ladders to decrease so that reaching the top became an impossible task. When the slaves realized their route of escape was gone, the ladders would break apart and those who could still move would scurry like mice seeking another way to freedom. But there was none. It was then that they looked up at her, wide-eyed with absolute terror and remorse. She savored those moments the most. Seca spun on her haunches and spotted her next victim, a slave who had the misfortune of being pushed too close to her grasp. She plucked him off the ground. The slave screamed in terror as she raised his body to her mouth. She gleefully gazed into his eyes as she bit deeply into his side. Blood sprayed across her face, her mouth filled with its warm, viscous fluids. Seca caught the telltale scent of another blizzard sweeping down from the crater peak of the dead giant. The sleeping volcano that had given birth to the ice realm of Gothos remained dormant. She took another bite out of the slave. It was a good day on Gothos. Seca's thoughts jerked to prison within a black silver sphere. Finally, she said. Malchris, you wonderful fool. A devious smile widened across her face as her conscious mind drifted away from her feral orgy and dragged to the mortal realm. If Malgris was strong enough, he would pull the corporeal aspect of her being through the amaranthine barrier as well. But if she was wrong about Malgris, 
or her intended path through the barrier, she would suffer the pain of a thousand deaths. Seca's astral eyes adjusted to the atmosphere of the black silver sphere. She recognized the residual energy left from using dark magic. The sticky mist clung to the surface of the spherical chamber like rogue strands of spider silk adrift in the wind. She could almost taste the suffering lingering in the metaphysical air. Seca felt the weight of heavy stones surrounding the chamber. She assumed the space had been delved deep within the roots of a mountain. It was a perfect prison with no visible entrances or doorways, and one last precaution against she that was to be summoned. Margaret was clever. In truth, she was powerless to make the journey on her own. The immortal mother's blasted amaranthine barrier now prevented any unauthorized crossings between realms. She supposed she was as much to blame for the barrier as any ambitious devil who stole souls from the mortal realm. The immortal mother had placed strict rules on the worlds she created. The great balance must remain constant amongst the different realms. That was the first and most revered law. Seca's last invasion to the mortal realm had tipped the scales and disrupted that precious balance enough to call the angels to war. If they had just stayed put in their clouds, she would have been victorious, but things did not always go as planned. Upon the smooth inner surface of the chamber's dark metal were laid thousands of intricate runes, each one representing another binding layer to keep her captive. Interlaced with those symbols were other wards against infernal attack. Pure silver chains crisscrossed the center and wove together to form the strands of a shimmering web. The links of the chains contained similar runes to those inscribed on the surface walls. As the strands of silver came together toward the center of the sphere, they formed a three-dimensional outline of a multiple-pointed star, a perfect trap to collect an archdevil from the abyss. Twenty-five warlocks, clad in heavy purple robes, hovered in the open space surrounding her summoned spirit. Their placement corresponded to the open areas of the three-dimensional star. Their breath clouded in the frigid air as they chanted ancient words. The sounds twisted and coiled like snakes from their mouths. Twenty-five bound slaves shimmered into reality in front of each warlock. The captives trembled uncontrollably from fear and the shock of the cold. The warlocks took black-bladed daggers from their sleeves, and as one plunged them deep into the abdomens of the slaves. Blood sprayed against the silver chains. The excess dripped to the bottom of the chamber. The moans of the dying echoed off the black silver walls. Pain was such a lovely bonding component, thought Seca. It was a nice touch to welcome her return to the mortal realm. Maugris hovered at the top of the chamber as his shifty eyes scanned the placement of his warlocks and accepted everything was in order. She ignored the insult of a mere mortal having control over her for any amount of time. She assured herself it was only temporary, a minor discomfort. Margaret's breath frosted the air before his face as the words of the final spell spilled from his mouth. Seca focused her wicked mind on the transference from one plane of existence to another. She absorbed every syllable and gesture as Margaret cast the binding spell. She searched for where his spellcraft faltered, for she had no doubt she would unravel the spell later. The magic of mortals was thin. Seca's essence shifted toward him. Malgris wore heavy robes lined with dense fur to protect him from the sub-zero temperature of the chamber. Dark maroon and bright orange sigils of protection radiated from his robes. The symbols revolved in a slow circle around him. Eventually, each one fluttered out of sight when its protective enchantment was secured. How quaint, Seca thought. A blood ruby pendant hung at Maurus's neck, pulsed like a heart as it joined with the magic flowing through the chamber. He had prepared well for this confrontation, yet she still scoffed at his trinkets and false confidence. Seca searched for the mental flame of the sorcerer. It was like finding a moat of sawdust in the sand, Mortals were such insignificant beings outside of the energy of their souls, she thought with contempt. She poured her consciousness into the endeavor. There, she found him. 
She squirmed in glee. He was nothing compared to her. Seca plunged herself into Maugris like the sharp barb of a scorpion. A preternatural awareness flooded into his thoughts. She felt his entire being gasp at her arrival. This was the first test. Seca would use the surprise of her overwhelming presence to gain control over him. The wards around him flared brighter. She snuffed the lesser ones out without much of a thought. Maugris staggered. She must be careful. If he lost control, the spell would unravel before it took hold. If he were unable to bring her corporal form into the mortal realm, then her scheme would be delayed. She couldn't start over. She needed more souls now. She knew Margaret had never confronted such raw power as hers. What mortal had? He fought against her will like a desperate man caught in a riptide. The more he struggled, the more she dragged him out to sea. The two engaged in a precarious tug of war. If she pulled too hard, she would break him, and the connection would be lost. If she gave in too readily to the summons, she would have a difficult time breaking the spell later. Time worked against her, as Sisvander approached her now defenseless Garthos. She felt Margaret's strength decline. The final summoning spell had siphoned away too much of his magical strength. He had underestimated the resources needed to control one of her might. If Margris proved to be too weak to enable her to cross over, then it would end badly for him. The Amarinthian barrier would devour him along with the dark magic he used to conduct the spell. She thought of Aetanos wasting away in her dungeon. How had he been granted access to the abyss when all others of his kind were denied? The riddle still plagued her. Seca eased off the drowning assault and withdrew direct contact with his essence. Instead, she flowed through his mind like a cerebral fog. She caressed his memories and absorbed his desires. She sucked at his mortal coil and gently probed him for weaknesses. She showed him visions of ultimate power. He could be a god. Just surrender. His foolish pride refused her. Rather than succumb to her will, he would end his own life. Seca watched in frustration as Maurice's body shriveled beneath his heavy robes. He was too weak. He had lost control of the dark magic, and now it was feasting on him. His eyes were wide and wild. He was desperate for more energy, and the connection faltered. He called to the other warlocks in the room for support. Lend me your strength! I am losing her! he yelled. Seca saw no help forthcoming. Interesting. She would use this information against him in the future, if there were a future for the failing mage. Somehow, Margaret regained enough of his composure to tap the blood ruby pendant on his chest. His eyes sought the nearest warlock hovering beneath him. The pendant flared bright red as its vampiric magic drank the life force of the unsuspecting warlock. The wrinkles smooth on Maugra's skin. His face became full once more. The empty husk of the dead warlock dropped out of sight. It landed with a thud and light splash in the bowels of the chamber. Maugra sent the pendant's magic to the next warlock, and then the next. The warlocks were consumed in rapid succession. Good, thought Seca. Very good. Her smile broadened as she watched each warlock disappear. He was back in control of the dark magic, and he enforced his will upon the spell of binding. Seca, archdevil of Gathos and queen of the Frost Plain, I, Maugris the Infinite, bind you to me. Do my bidding, and ten thousand and one soul slaves shall be yours to devour. I make this pact with you. Come, Seca, come to your new master. Maugris cried out in a voice magnified by the stolen energy he had consumed. A horrific wail flooded into the chamber, causing blood to erupt from Maugris's ears. Streams of red flowed freely out of his nostrils. The chamber shuddered. Then the chains vibrated, as if shaken in the hands of giants. A pinprick of light appeared in the center of the star prison. It grew as its shape changed, first as a globe, and then as something with the distinct form of a massive horror. The preternatural wail grew louder in the chamber. The sweat covering Maugris' body turned to frost. He churned out heavy white breaths into the stale air. 
Sekka's abyssal form joined with her consciousness and materialized at the center of the star prison. Her raptor talons flashed out to tear and rend. Her chest heaved and her breast swelled as she became entangled in the silver chains. Heart muscles rippled against the magical bonds surrounding her. She could hear the sizzle of her flesh as a touch of the wards burned into her skin. Sekka shrieked in pain. The soul slave she brought forth from her orgy on Gothos dissolved in her clawed hand. She maliciously glared at Malgris for depriving her of such a savory meal. She played the part of the bound slave perfectly. The silver chains were pulled tight like a fisherman's net and wrapped around her writhing body, locking her in place. Sapphire blue rooms shimmered off the chains, then vanished into the air. She howled in rage. The spell of binding was complete. It held her in its magical grip. But the battle was far from over. Sekka smiled at him, her eyes she knew betraying her otherworldly intelligence. She marveled at her cleverness. She had succeeded in passing through the amaranthine barrier. Now she could exert more power. She reapplied pressure on Margaret's mind and squeezed his thoughts together into mush. He buckled but did not break. She tested his resolve with pleasures rather than pain. Lower your guard, mortal. I shall make you king of all you see. Release me, and I shall grant your every desire. Yours shall be the sea that sires legions made for conquest. I saw you in a vision. Now you are here before me. You are mine to command, Margaret stuttered. His words came slowly, but they gave him confidence. Enough with your torments. Sekka howled. She could not harm Margris, not yet. The magic placed upon the chains was too deep. Pacts had to be honored. She must do as he bid. What is it you wish of me, mortal? Sekka spoke directly into Margris's mind. He shuddered. You shall be my instrument of despair upon the lands of Hannah. Margaret said aloud, the bindings placed upon you shall force you to obey my commands. Fail you to provide the soul slave's promise to bind me will be your undoing, little mage. Sekka fought once more against the invisible chains that bound her. While her body convulsed in pain from the binding, she continued to probe his mind. She sought areas of weakness she might exploit in the future. Visions, you say? hissed Sekka. She now spoke with a woman's sensual mouth as her bestial form changed shape into more subtle curves. Tell me more. Sekka lounged across her divan like a feline leisurely basking in the warmth of the sun. Ironically, her chamber was cold and dark. Precious items from the three kingdoms filled the room. Margaret's minions had brought her thick bear fur, skin from the northern grizzlies of Trosk. There were exquisite wooded chairs, hewed from a single block of Barokia's mighty redwood trees in the corner. Hanging on the walls were rare silk tapestries of vibrant color and detail. Sekka suspected they were stolen from the jungle tribes of Sun. Uh, it all bored her. She decided to redecorate her room with the mutilated bodies of the playthings Margaret had gifted her. These witches and warlocks shall serve as your cabal, he had said. Their skill and ability were laughable. Most she took as sex slaves, but their uses were limited. She draped their skins over the priceless chairs for Barokia. Their blood cast a rosy reflection throughout the room. Her thoughts lurched to the image of Margris. He had summoned her. The compulsion placed upon her still held, but barely. Soon she would have it unraveled, and his trivial magic would no longer have sway over her. A fresh batch of apprentices had arrived. Sekka studied them through black-on-black -black eyes. They observed the flayed skins of their predecessor, and an uneasiness passed through the group. Their breath frosted the air as they patiently waited for her to command them. The men and women before her were frail, weak magicians at best, but such were the shortcomings of all mortals. They dressed in the garb of witches and warlocks, 
Sick I saw them, only as costumed children playing with silly wands and staffs. They were mere sycophants, who posted being bold wielders of magic, yet knowing nothing of the dark arts. All sought her favor for a chance to drink from the fountain of deep magic that flowed through her. They would get nothing from her. She smiled pleasantly at them. She would let Lord Ossiax play with them for a day once he arrived. Then they would understand power. For now, they were distractions to alleviate her boredom. I'm sure she could find a use for them eventually. She rose like a serpent from her repose, causing her sheer robe to flow down over her shapely legs like a slow waterfall. Seduction radiated from her as she approached the first apprentice. He trembled in anticipation. Did he fear her or desire her? It mattered not. Both were acceptable forms of supplication to the archdevil. As much as she relished the physical strength of her abyssal body, she did savor the subtlety of her human form. Her senses appreciated things differently. Perhaps it was due to the frailty of this body. Humans cherished life more since they could be ripped away at a moment's notice. That was why the human soul was such valuable currency in both the abyss and the seven heavens. It was the soul where the real power of mortals existed and sadly for them, they wouldn't realize it until after their death. Such was the great paradox of all things set forth by the immortal mother. A flock of neophytes fluttered around her like black butterflies. They followed in her wake as she left her grisly chamber. Seca casually led them down a long flight of stairs en route to the central keep. She occasionally stopped to lay her hands on the sigils of warding and binding that were carved into the stone. It was an irrelevant precaution Malgris had added to his fortress. The sigils held no sway over her, not any more. She snuffed each one out as she meandered through Racklash Fortress. She knew the sigils would be back in place when she returned on the same corridor. It was just something to pass the time. Once she had broken the foundation spell, all secondary and tertiary spells would fail as well. Seca eventually came to another room filled with stacked books and unrolled scrolls. Maugris was there grumbling to himself. He paced before twelve bound slaves lined against a wall. Seca assumed they were borderland peasants, villagers who chose a piss-poor existence along the fringes of Barokia. Maugris's hands were clasped behind his bent back as he walked. He mumbled gibberish to himself between swift intakes of breath. He turned toward the slaves. Be honored, for you have been chosen. Your souls will fuel the otherworldly gifts provided by my concubine and slave. A higher purpose awaits you. He turned away as if distracted by another conversation. He returned to mumbling in broken sentences. Then he raised his hands in a proclamation. By my will shall a new age be delivered to the three kingdoms, and vengeance shall know my name. The twelve slaves were on their knees. Tight, razor-sharp cords crisscrossed their bodies. Each breath saw the cords dig deeper into their flesh. Purple elixirs were force-fed to the slaves by small, gnome-like creatures. It was a special brew Seca had taught to Maugris that kept the slaves alive. Seca remained at the entrance, unimpressed. Maugris saw her and turned away, irritated by her lack of urgency to his summons. You are finally here. It is time. I must have the Frost Legions of Gothos. I command you to open a portal. He refused to look at her. He wore layers of furs to fend off the cold that seeped through the stones of his tower. He moved to a desk cluttered with bound scrolls, hunched over a massive book open at the marked spot. He carefully scanned the brittle page of the ancient tome. Malgris pointed over his shoulder at the twelve slaves bound against the far wall. Those there, use them as you must to open the portal. Seca shook her head. No, it was the same demand he had made countless times. You would bring forth a legion of demons, but no commander to lead them. Are you mad? Lord Ossiax must come first. I will lead them, Margaret said with confidence. I do not trust you or your white mane demon. Lord Ossiax had been the general of my Frost Legion for millennia. Only by his presence and force of will can the armies of Gothos be controlled. Without him, the greater demons and fiends would revert to their vicious and chaotic nature. 
the weakest spawns would be butchered without a second thought. Might I remind you of the hatred and rivalry all demon kind have for one another? I am aware of the feuds of demons and devils alike. All those mad creatures, eternally scurrying up the layers of ascendancy until they are brought low by overwhelming power. Quite so, she said. He looked straight into her eyes. It seems this Fander has been busy during your absence. The Red Devil moves through the abyss uncontested. He leaves the realms of his rivals covered in molten slag. Now there is an archdevil worthy of the title. Perhaps he intends to finish what was once started so long ago. What would happen, I wonder, if he rekindled the fires of the dead giant? You dare. There are many in the abyss who gladly divulge information for the proper payment. I have watched your struggle against the Red Devil for quite some time. Seca kept a calm expression, though she internally seethed them with fury. She knew he was testing her to see if what he said was true. She would give him no such satisfaction, nor would she reveal her predicament in the lower plains. She would have her day with him. This fool Maugris knew nothing of the depths of deception and pain a true archdevil could conceive. Maugris strode from behind the table. No, your pet, Osiax, shall not have sole reign over the demonic army you will provide me. You are a cunning devil, but that was never part of my plan. I will turn my attention to other lands where the three kingdoms of Hanna are mine. Perhaps I shall also rule the wastelands you call home. And when that time comes, I will lead a queen to rule at my side. If you are worthy, I may grant such favor. She felt a cold sparkle in her eyes and hoped it didn't betray her knowledge of a different outcome. She decided then that merely ripping his soul from his body and dining on his tender memories would not be enough punishment for his insolence. She would reserve a special place for him in the coldest pith of Gothos. Maugris would suffer for ages uncounted. But for now, she would wait. He still had a role to play. Now, Chris, why must you tease me such? You know I am already your captive. Your will is my command. But you would be wise to heed my advice. Lord Osiax shall obey you as I must. Do not press your agenda, devil. I demand you open me a portal. Bring forth the means to destroy my enemies. I grow tired of your excuses and delays. With what raw material? Do you think the sole energy of a few slaves to be enough to bridge the gap between realms? But no matter. The Amaranthine barrier prevents such a portal for opening for any length of time. Do not mock my intelligence. Use your infernal magic to compensate. Certain divine rules must be obeyed, even for one as mighty as me. However, there is another way. Bring me the ever-hero of this age. Then you will know the power of the abyss. Agris brought his hand up to massage his forehead. His eyes squinted closed. The ever-heroes of Athenos are a myth. They are little stories created over the centuries by weak-minded commoners and the monks who control them. Even if the ever-hero were real, he would be a pale comparison to the demigod himself. What use could a fragment of the divine possibly be to help you breach the barrier? Malgris looked hard into her eyes. His eyes shifted back and forth, as if the solution to a complex equation was within his grasp. Unless... He shook his head, dismissing the idea. Ah, it matters not. Athenos has not walked these lands in many, many years. He has forsaken this realm. His religion is dead. His faithful are scattered and lost. Maugris smiled as if he had won a significant victory. He staggered to a large map hanging on the wall. He tried to hide his discomfort. Her relentless mind-probing left him weary and weak. He traced his fingers over the Cerebe mountain range in the southern province of Parochia. Everything is happening according to my will. By now that vainglorious Duke Shiverig has discovered the location of the monasteries. There will be no one to stop me once these troublesome monks of the Four Orders have been eradicated. No, you must not harm the monks. They are part of unwinding the riddle of the Ever-Hero. The masters may perish, but the younger acolytes must survive. They are needed. 
Malgris turned back to Sika. His eyes flared like that of a starved animal protecting a morsel of food. Enough! I do not wish to hear any more nonsense of ever heroes. The monks will die. His eyes grew dark. You are mine to control. Now open the portal. Yes, I am bound by you. But you can only receive a fraction of my power. Now, if a chaos gate were to be opened, do you take me for a fool? A living chaos gate would mean the end of this realm. Obviously, you misunderstand the intricacies of a chaos gate and the rules of deep magic. Enlighten me, Margaret said. A chaos gate only allows passage to those deemed worthy by its creator. Yes, others may pass, but the cost is significant. But more importantly, those who pass through would be leashed to the will of the creator of the gate. Seca doubted if that were true. I'd never ruin a good story with the truth. Yes, and? Seca wondered how one of such dull intelligence possessed the magical strength to have summoned her from Carthos. My dear Malgris, if the forger of the portal happened to be under the control of a powerful sorcerer, well, then who would control the horde? She gave a mental tug at the strings of his desire for conquest. A chaos gate would allow for the entirety of the Frost Legion to bypass the Amaranthine barrier. She had him. He shook his finger at Seca, as if he was the brunt of a playful joke. You have your worth, devil. A simple portal will not do when a chaos gate provides all I need. Seca crossed her arms over her chest. If there is no ever hero, then there is no chaos gate. As I have said, I must have the raw material to create the bridge. Only the soul of one fused with the essence of the divine can provide the required building blocks. She spoke to him as if he were a petulant child. And unless you are hiding eight of us somewhere in your dreary fortress, I will need the next best thing. Malgris's demeanor shifted again. How can one such as you be so blind? The ever hero is a myth. I was a chosen of eight and us at one time. I had power, real power, and the demigod betrayed me. If there were to be an ever hero of this time, it would have been me. When the time of fire and famine came to Barokia, the crown looked to me to quell the land's fury with my art. I crafted a spell to tame the wild Illuminati's magic infecting the land. It was a brilliant work of creative genius. My spell would save the realm and ensure my legacy as the greatest mage in the history of Barokia. But something went wrong. I had made sure every nuance was accounted for and in place. Margaret looked past Seca, as if remembering the horrible event. His words came in a whisper. It was Athenos. He was jealous of my great accomplishment. When I called for his light to add a spark of the divine to my spell, he went silent. I was left with insufficient power to complete the spell. It failed. Banishment, they said. Banish the mad one to the north, but I shall have my revenge. The monks of Aethon must die first, then those fool nobles in the city of Spires. Sika smirked at Malgris's tale. If the man only knew the truth of the matter. It is a touching tale. Nonetheless, the pace in which you exact your revenge is in your own hands. Enough with your stubborn behavior, hellborn. There is no ever hero. If you cannot provide me with what I desire, I will replace you with another who can. Malgris moved back to the long table, piled with ancient parchments. He leaned on its edge for support. He rubbed his chin with his hand. If I was strong enough to summon you, then there are others whom I could call. A devious smile creased his weathered face. I wonder how eager this Fander would be to carry out my wishes if I offered him his arch nemesis bound and gagged on a silver platter. Are you prepared to watch the flames of the Red Devil consume your precious Gathos? Sick I grew bored with the debate. Do what you must, or you can. Sis Fander would need the same means of establishing a portal great enough for what you ask. A devilish desire was to rip him to shreds, but she was still bound. Time, she needed just a bit more time. She approached Malgris delicately. She brushed up against his body with slow and sensual movements. 
let us not fight. You are mighty, Malchus, and your will shall be done. I can tell you are fatigued. Let me soothe your weary head. She turned his head to her breasts. His body followed. She held him as a mother would a child. Margaret assisted her embrace at first, but finally succumbed to the coolness of her body. The softness of her flesh was too much to endure in his weakened state. That's it. Just rest. Margaret's defenses dropped for a moment. It was just enough for an opening for Seca to purr an inconspicuous spell of suggestion into his ear. I shall open a small portal and bring forth Lord Arsiax to lead your armies. However, remember the ever-hero is the key to your ultimate vengeance. Find him, and you shall rule whatever realm you wish. Then she lifted his head and gently kissed his lips. Perhaps you would like to start with the one before you? Her sheer gown fell to her ankles. Her naked body was a masterpiece of desire. The torchlight caressed her muscular form and lush curves. She stepped out of the pile of rumpled fabric, a slowly pirouetted before the sorcerer. Do you like what you see? She deftly removed his robes. Malgris mumbled some agreeable words about Lord Osiax. He would put men to the task of finding the one she desired. Her tongue was a shock of ice over his body. The stiffness of his member was a testament that he burned for more. As she had expected, her devious charms would be the first of her power to break through the shackles of Malgris's binding. Humans were so easy to manipulate. The coupling was filled with moans of delight for Malgris. She beckoned a forgotten flock of magicians closer. Their eyes were filled with lust. Craving hands reached out to touch her. She smiled with wicked joy. A provocative human form altered its shape. Horns, talons, and teeth grew from her body. A magician screamed in horror, but they could not turn away. She compelled them forward and feasted on their flesh. Margaret writhed in ecstasy beneath her terrible form. Soon he was coated in blood. Seca mentally whispered the words of a summoning spell into Margaret's mind. He repeated the words aloud, lost as he was in the bliss of her attention. The tear in the amaranthine barrier caused by Aethelna's arrival on Gathos had grown wider when she was summoned to the mortal realm. Now the path was easy to follow if one knew the way. A flash of light brightened the chamber, followed by a thunderous boom. The walls shook, and stacks of books tumbled to the floor. The temperature dropped, and frost covered everything in the room. The slaves lined against the far wall shivered in pain, and the cords dug deeper into their flesh. Lord Osiax leaped into the mortal realm. He was a huge demon, standing on two muscular legs. One arm was human-shaped down to a hand with five fingers. The other arm ended in five long tentacles cascading from where his elbow would be. Hundreds of small sucking mouths with sharp teeth lined the surface of each tentacle. His broad back was covered in coarse alabaster hair. His nostrils flared in anticipation of violence. Asiax had the head of an arctic lion. A full mane of thick fur framed his face. Two long canine teeth jutted from his jaws. His skin was the color of bleached bone. He stepped through the broken and mauled bodies to Seca's side and bowed deeply before her as the juice of the dying magician spread across the floor. What is it you wish of me, my mistress? Seca was covered in gore. She swiveled her hulking form to face him. Look at the banquet our little mage has set for us, Lord Arsiax. Her wicked grin drooled long strands of swaying bile. Her flesh changed back to her exposed human body. Broad swaths of blood smeared down her neck and covered her breasts and legs. Arsiax's eyes landed on Maugris. Let me devour the mortal flea at your loins. A purple tongue lolled out of his mouth and curled around his enormous incisors. Margris came to his senses. He squirmed out from under Seca, parting the pool of blood in a long smear. He grabbed his robe and stood indignant before Oziax. Margris surveyed his study, confused as to what had taken place. He assumed a regal stance. Bow down before me, creature. I am your master now. 
deep baritone chuckle resonated from Arsiax's throat. He ignored Malgris. What are your orders, my queen? No, Malgris said. He raised his hand to strike Arsiax. Arsiax's eyes flashed with anger. Who is this human worm who stands before mighty Arsiax? I shall peel the skin from your pitiful body for your lack of reverence. Arsiax's body swelled and bristled. He shook where he stood but could do no more. The magic that held Sekka also bound the great demon lord. I command you now, Lord Arsiax, demon warlord of the Frost Legions. Malgris walked closer to Arsiax. His confidence grew with each step. Colorful monikers, but I am unimpressed. A more capable demon lord would have put an end to his fander when he was an irrelevant lesser devil. But now the red devil has grown in power, and Narciax had lost his opportunity. Margaret then turned to Sekka. Perhaps next time. Do not leave a demon to do a devil's work, eh? Narciax bellowed out in rage. Black sigils flared to life above his head. A stench of dark magic mixed with the odor of drying blood and entrails. He lunged at Malgris, but was held fast by the power of the binding spell. Nonetheless, Malgris took a few steps backward. A nervous expression filled his face. Sekka draped her arms around Osiak's neck. She whispered in his ear, Calm yourself, my beautiful beast. Remember why we are here. She then spoke in a louder voice for Malgris to hear. Apologize to Malgris and assume a more suitable appearance for your new master. Lord Osiax followed Sekka's lead. He morphed into his human form. A tall, muscular man with long, straight hair appeared where the demon once stood. There, that's better. Now come, Lord Arsiax, there is much to prepare, Sekka said. She walked from the room. Arsiax brushed past Malgris. Careful with your words, mortal. The fates are fickle. The path they set is never clear. Your feet may not always tread on such a fortunate ground. Twelve. Kasai. Giant, finger-shaped spires of granite towered along the numerous mountain peaks of the Cereba Range. Nestled among the natural rock formation was the Monastery of Urdu. It was built to blend with the stoic presence of the mountain without creating distracting blemishes to its rocky surface. Valley forests of pine and oak stubbornly stretched up the sides of the high spires to include the monastery in their wooden embrace. Crest eagles and spire vultures hung lazily in the air on warm thermals that rose from the lower lands. The monks of Ordu traversed the spire-shaped peaks via a maze of hanging rope bridges. Small bells and colorful ribbons were woven into the hemp strands of the ropes, and the acoustics of the mountain range would carry the sounds of the bells for miles, adding a layer of mystery and misdirection, which confused those seeking to infiltrate the ancient haven. The bells also served a different function. A person unaccustomed to walking the swaying bridges would leave an awkward sound pattern. The sentries could discern who approached based on the melodies of the bridges. But those were precautions from a different time when the monks were hunted and prosecuted by tyrannical kings and bloodthirsty warlords. The four orders of Aetlinus were meant to unify all people together under the laws of heaven. Unfortunately, this ideal often created a conflicting agenda with nefarious rulers. Spies would be sent to infiltrate the sanctuaries of Ordo, Sumitu, Harmuno, and Metho to discover the secrets of the strange monks. In time, assassins were contracted to remove influential members of each order. Over time, the locations of the monasteries had been lost. Maps were purposely removed from all government archives. The mountain passes were blocked and well-known bridges destroyed. Only the memories of the highest officials at the High Temple of Illumination and the master monks of each order were entrusted with such valuable information. The monastery locations were passed from one generation to the next verbally and with great care. Formal maps were forbidden. The monks took great precautions to thwart any unwanted guests from finding their homes. Unfortunately, no fortress could remain hidden forever, nor was it impregnable. Kasai pulled his outer robe a little closer. Today was a cold, blustery day. Brightly colored leaves fell from the trees and swirled like dust devils on the damp ground. The smell of early winter was in the air. A loose truce had formed between Kasai and Daku during the weeks since the ordeal on the mountain. 
Thankfully, Daku's anger had lessened with time, as it usually did. Brother Jurai and Brother Murad accompanied them as they walked along a soft gravel path. The two younger acolytes followed a few steps behind. The brothers collected dead wood for the monastery fires. The masters are unfair to me, especially Master Shoker. I am constantly rebuked when the opportunity for advancement is clear. What is worse, I'm punished for excelling, Daku said. He kicked a dead branch off the path instead of picking it up. I have mastered all of the striking positions of the 21 fire columns. I am the only one who fully understands the Vindu Uni disciplines. My fire Zindo is the most powerful of all the brothers. It probably rivals the level of the masters by now. I understand Vindu Uni, Kasai said. Sure you do, Kasai. Kasai couldn't help but see the similarities between Daku and the branch his friend had kicked. Daku held on to every injustice, no matter how slight, and let it fester into something twisted and broken. The masters teach us what we need to learn. Perhaps ask yourself why they treat you as you say. Seek the answer from within, Kasai said. I already know the answer. They are worried that one day, perhaps soon, I will be their equal. They fear me. They fear the change my fighting methods will bring to the order. Aethanus left the High Temple of Illumination for the same reasons. That is why they keep me from the more powerful mysteries, Daku snapped back. That's not why Aethanus formed the Four Orders, Kasai said. Daku was churning through more than just that one event in his head. It was his way. He liked to dig up nightmares from the past and make them into present battles. Hey, are you two going to do some work or just chirp all the morning like little birds? Jirai called out. He was small and of similar build to Kasai, with a broad smile and contagious laugh. Morad and I have already filled up our sacks. See, Kasai, more taunts. Now it is coming from those of lesser ranks as well. I should teach them a lesson. Jirai means nothing by it. He's just trying to fit in, Kasai said. The four monks strolled down the winding path until they came across the broken nest of a scarlet swallow. The nest had been blown from its perch and smashed into the dirt. Scattered about the ruined nest were three dead chicks. A fourth had somehow managed to survive the fall. It chirped fearfully for its mother on the unfamiliar ground, while the mother swallow helplessly squawked from a higher branch in the tree. Morad did his best to repair the nest and then, with careful hands, placed it back into the tree. Jirai had taken up the helpless chick and gently laid it in the nest. There you go, little one, Jirai said. What do you think you two are doing? Daku said. He snatched the nest and the chick from the safety of the branch. What does it look like we're doing? We're going to save the chick. See, the mother is right over there. Now put the nest back in the tree. Give it to me, Jirai said. Daku hid the nest behind his back. Mother should not have chosen such a poor spot to build a nest. As Master Sugar said, it is the natural way of things. This chick will die with its siblings. Kasai realized Daku still felt the pain of humiliation by Master Shogar in the sparring circle. If Daku had to endure the worst of the master's example, then all the brotherhood would feel his pain as well. Daku would not allow himself to become a parody of weakness. That's hardly what Master Shogar means. Just give the bird back, Morad said. The mother bird needs to learn a lesson. Next time she will take more care when choosing a nesting site, Daku said. The eyes of the younger monks became anxious. Kasai understood how they felt. Daku was in a raw mood. Kasai saw the telltale spark in Daku's eyes. He wanted a fight, and the slightest provocation would set him off. Leave the chick alone. It is not your place to play judge and executioner, Jirai said. He reached out to try and snatch the nest away from Daku. Daku was quicker. Is it not? And who are you to stop me? Come on, I'll let you have the first two strikes without retaliating. Daku, just give the bird back to Jirai. We still have to finish our shores, Kasai said. Just listen to Kasai. Besides, you can't hope the best of three of us at once, Murad said. Daku's face softened, as if he had finally come to his senses. Kasai saw through it, though. Daku's expression was always calm before he attacked. Kasai would need to act fast if he was to save Murad from a painful lesson. Daku snapped the neck of the chick and dropped it back in the nest. Here. Morad took the nest. His mouth was wide open. No! Kasai was shocked. Why? I told you, Kasai, the outside world is cruel. It is the natural way of things. Daku pushed past them. He continued walking alone on the path, humming a peaceful tune. The night was calm. 
A fragrant, sugary aroma drafted up from the turning leaves of the katsura trees growing in the valley below. The air swept through cracked windows and into the sparse sleeping quarters of the monks. The full moon was bright and bathed the room in soft blue light. Forty-four monks slept on plain cots. All but one rested peacefully. Kasai tossed and turned in a half-sleep. Sweat beaded on his forehead, and the wool blanket tangled around his legs in a knot. Creatures of fell magic chased him in the dark. He wanted to run, but his legs moved as if they were being sucked into a thick mire. He heard the gnashing teeth of the creatures behind him. They were gaining ground. The nightmare changed. Kasai watched his mother die by the hands of a foul, eyeless ghoul. Meanwhile, his father ran into the embrace of a fiend, draped in a regal ice-blue gown. She wore a high headdress made of animal horns and human bones. The adulteress had stark white hair, white skin, onyx eyes, and indigo lips, and eyed Kasai as she held his father in a lover's embrace. The woman spoke the same word to him every night. Mine. Kasai woke with a shiver, and his skin felt clammy. The nightmare frequently occurred now. Each night revealed more of the story. He looked around the dormitory to see everyone still asleep. Kasai sighed. Lucky. Kasai told no one about his dreams, and today had been no different. He was thankful for his daily routine. It made it easier for him to believe that his unsettling nightmares were nonsense. He reasoned with himself during dawn chores that there was nothing wrong with him. He was calm again by the end of morning meditation. By the end of the day, he had all but forgotten his dreams. Kasai stretched as he paused for a moment to enjoy the orange glow of the setting sun. The last bit could be seen through the high spire surrounding Ordu. He had yet to finish his dusk chores and would be late for dinner. Cold stew again, he thought. He had drawn out her sweeping duty again. The stairs and path outside the monastery walls were cleaned meticulously in the early morning and once more in the early evening. The master said the work helped to clear a person's mind of unwanted debris collected from the trials of life. Kasai just saw it as a never-ending cycle of work. The late autumn sun lit the cliffs and valleys in a luminous glow. The mountain took on a cool purple hue, while the colors of turning leaves held on to the last warmth of the sun. The cold nights came early this time of year, and as sun descended from sight, the icy blast of chilly winds gusted against the mountainside. The eerie howls took Kasai out of his reverie. Kasai thought of his brothers inside the warm refectory, enjoying hot stew and homemade bread bowls. His mouth watered with anticipation of food, and his stomach let him know it agreed. The faster he finished sweeping, the sooner he would be inside eating his dinner. He arched his back and moved it side to side. Best get on with it, he said. He had one more section to go before he was finished. A deep orange glow lingered in the sky. Perhaps tomorrow would bring some warmer weather. Wishful thinking, he thought, and moved to the remaining section of stairs. As Kasai turned to cross the last bridge... He was distracted by small reflections of light coming from the cliff of the east wall. The top of the cliff housed the inner halls and many of the common structures of the monastery. What was that? He squinted to get a better look and saw that some of his brothers were dusk climbing. The evening sky bathed the robes in dark mustard color. Kasai was unaware of a work detachment assigned to the east wall this evening. One of the masters must have scheduled a nighttime scaling exercise. Probably Master Dory. He was known for forcing brothers to confront their fear, conquer it, and grow stronger. Kasai thought back to his experience on the mountain and sympathized with his brothers on the rock. Kasai watched them scale higher along the sheer wall and silently cheered them on. Night climbing was a challenge, especially for the younger novices. He tried to discern who was leading the climb and who followed. He couldn't recognize the body shapes belonging to any of his brothers. That doesn't seem right. Kasai tilted his hand to one side. He noticed the monks moved awkwardly. There was no fluidity to their motion. The monks conserved their strength and used the momentum of the body to flow up and down the wall. Their unique skill of crisscrossing arms, hooking heels, and dropping legs enabled them to grip onto impossible holds. His brothers moved like elegant spiders along the rock wall. But these climbers used brute strength to lunge from one hole to the next. Kasai saw the climbers driving hand picks into the rock. His brothers didn't need anchor holes to climb a sheer surface. Kasai sharpened his focus for a better look. 
Were those ropes dangling down from the lead climbers? More climbers followed the lines from below. He broadened his view, and so many groups were scaling the wall. His stomach sank. These weren't monks, and this wasn't a training exercise. The monastery was under attack. Kasai watched in shock as the invaders crested the cliff and scurried to the monastery walls. They threw grappling hooks that lodged into the crannels of the stone and climbed again. Long swords were strapped to their backs and reflected the last of the sun's glowing light. Within moments, the attackers were over the top and in the courtyard. Black smoke rose in the half-light of the white walls that protected the central buildings. The wind changed. The stench of something greasy and burnt wafted past him. Gasai froze with fear. What was happening? Where were the sentries, and why had no alarm been sounded? He took a few steps forward. He stopped. What was he doing? If he went directly to the front gate, he would be spotted. The smoke intensified, and now he could see flames lapping up to the sky. Even if he went to the monastery, what could he possibly do? He was only a junior monk. Sparring in a controlled environment was one thing. Fighting real foes was something altogether different. Naku was right. Kasai was not prepared for the real world and the many challenges it held. The masters would be able to deal with this threat, but they could not be everywhere at once. His mind froze with hesitation. He had to do something to help. He looked at his hands. His broom was a poor excuse for a proper staff. He would be better off using his hands. Don't be stupid, Kasai. You're safe here. He told himself his reasoning was sound. Baku would organize the older acolytes into fighting groups, and they would mount a defense. He couldn't do anything from here. Kasai thought of the younglings. They would be led to Sazen Hall for safety. Best to get them out of the way when the fighting started. More smoke appeared over the walls of the monastery. The meditation hall was on fire. The younglings might already be trapped inside. Intruders crawled over the walls like an infestation of vermin. Kasai heard booming thunderclaps resounded from the courtyard and felt the air shudder. The wind carried the smell of sulfur and spoiled meat. A cold shiver shook his body as Kasai remembered the same horrible odor from his early childhood. It could only mean one thing. The creatures of evil had returned and were using dark magic against his brothers. They could already be dead. His family was being stolen from him. Not again. Now was the time to act. Kasai took a hesitant step forward. The front gate was lost. Was there another access available on the eastern wall? Think. His eyes followed the tracks of a series of bridges. Each path resulted in a dead end. Time was against him. This portion of the slope was covered in meditation circuits. Each bridge circled back to the same spot. The wind carried the screams of his brothers. Hurry! His mind raced. Come on, come on, Kasai. People are counting on you. His heart pounded in his chest. Sweat beaded on his forehead. He couldn't think. He was useless. Kasai forced his eyes closed. He inhaled deeply through his nose and let the cool night air fill his chest. He let it out slowly. Again. Breathe in. Breathe out. He tapped into his water zindu to calm the fire in his spirit. He wished he had a better grasp on the zindu mysteries. Slowly, the level of his water zindu rose. His fear and frustration sank into the memory of a favorite swamp from his childhood. Kasai focused on removing the tangle of false paths before him. He let their patterns dissolve from the maze of possibilities meant to baffle and confuse an enemy. By doing so, the true way would reveal itself. There, a narrow fissure that collected rainwater and melted snow. The fissure fit into an interior basin, which the monks used for their water supply. For once, Kasai was glad for his smaller size. He had to cross two bridges and leave the main path, but then he could easily downclimb to the natural aqueduct. Kasai raced across the first bridge on sure footing. He would not abandon his brothers. He traversed in such a way as to add a new song to the chiming bells, one filled with determination and courage. He reached a fissure without being seen by the invaders. He climbed inside. The echoes of fighting bounced off the inner walls. Kasai tried his best to keep the sounds of the dying from his mind. Instead, he concentrated on the twists and turns of the natural draining system. He gradually descended. The shaft opened to a broader space. Beneath him was the basin that housed the refectory water supply. He scanned the walls for the opening where his brothers drew water. That was his way into the monastery. Kasai moved carefully along the slippery surface. 
The inner walls only offered sharp, tiny nibs for handholds. The tips of his fingers became raw, but he kept moving forward. He thought about what he would do once he reached the top. His best option would be to find one of the masters. Master Dor, his chamber was closest to the refectory. Kasai would start there. He emerged from the well shaft and into a small room. He peered into the refectory and saw uneaten food resting on cloth placemats. Water mugs were turned over had rolled to the floor. In some places, water still dripped from the solid oak table, but otherwise it was empty. Kasai ran to Master Dorhe's chamber. He was doubtful that he would find him there, but decided he needed to start somewhere. Perhaps Master Dorhe had left a youngling behind to convey his instructions in case any of the older brothers had the same idea as Kasai. The noise of battle was everywhere. Otherworldly screams echoed through the empty stone halls. What was he doing? He had no plan and scarcely any real information. Rushing blindly into battle was a poor tactic. Kasai had traveled these halls for years, but suddenly he felt disoriented and unsure which way to go. His mind held too many questions demanding answers. Who had attacked the monastery? What purpose would it serve? The monks of Aetanus had no political affiliation or any real influence in the regal circles of the king's court. They were servants of the land and the people who dwelled there. Nothing more. They were only monks. Who would need to slaughter monks? The entrance to Master Dorhe's chamber was before him. The door was open, and Kasai ran in, but stopped short. He gasped in shock when he saw that Master Dorhe was dead. The invaders murdered him, but he was not just killed, beheaded. The master's body lay in a keep on the floor, his head placed on the windowsill overlooking the courtyard. It was clear the killers had wanted Master Dory to witness the attack on the monastery, even with dead eyes. There was no evidence of a fight, and nothing was amiss or broken in the room. There was no sign of struggle. It was as if Master Dory had been taken completely unaware. But that was impossible. The room twisted and turned as the weight of events pounded into Kasai's mind. His entire body began to tremble. He thought he would fall to the floor. The sounds of battle flooded back to his ears. The mark of Mizzen flared on his forearm, lending him courage. Kasai could do nothing here and was needed elsewhere. He raced to Master Kunshin's chamber next. He reached the chamber panting for breath. The old man was dead as well. His heart had been ripped from his chest. The organ sagged from a dagger driven to the wall. Again, there was no struggle. It made no sense. One does not take a master of Odo unaware and end their life so casually. Kasai was no longer registering the immensity of events unfolding before him. Everything was condensed down to individual moments that could be more easily identified, even if not understood. What of Master Sugar? Had the same fate befallen the blind master? Without the three masters to lead them, his brothers were doomed. His heart pounded in his chest as he ran in the direction of Master Sugar's chamber. Unconscious tears streamed from the corners of his eyes. He was losing his family again, and just as before, he was helpless to stop it. He rounded the corner of a hall too fast and tripped over the body of one of his brothers. The body had been torn to pieces. Terrible gashes were slashed across the larger parts. Kasai couldn't even recognize who had died. Was this the work of the same killer that had butchered the masters? There were no bodies of enemies anywhere. Who or what could be powerful enough to kill Master Dory and Master Kunshin without a fight? The inner hallways filled with smoke, and the air became thin and dark. Kasai changed his route and passed the Hall of Artifacts. It was a sacred area, and held the relics and ancient weapons of the Order of Urdu. The room was filling with smoke. So much would be lost in the fire. Kasai kept moving. He tried to understand what was happening around him. Taking out the masters made sense. They were the real threat at the monastery. His brothers could mount a counterattack, but it seemed unlikely they would be victorious against this foe. Master Sugar was next, or had already been murdered. Kasai's eyes stung. His visibility was dim from heavy smoke. Kasai clenched his fists when he heard the noise of battle getting louder. The enemy was near. He needed something to even the odds. He ran back into the Hall of Artifacts. He had grabbed the nearest weapon available and asked forgiveness later. Thick smoke filled the room. Kasai groped blindly for anything that was not locked behind a thick glass case. Nothing. Where were the keys? Not here. Only the masters held the keys to these locks. 
Why hadn't he thought about that earlier? The sound of fighting grew louder. He tested the strength of the locks, but they held fast. His eyes watered. The sigh was desperate. He stumbled farther into the hall of artifacts, searching for anything to help. A burnt wooden rafter had fallen and smashed through the case in the back of the room. Kasai was half blind from the smoke and reached for whatever was there. His hand found the familiar shape of a sanjigan. He grabbed the folded three-section staff and ran to help his brothers. The weapon felt oddly warm in his hands and was getting hotter as he approached the fighting. He rubbed the water from his eyes and looked at the weapon more closely. Oh no, Kasai said. He held Ninzazida, the fire serpent. Kasai had no time to put it back and search for another. Please don't curse me, Kasai said. He reluctantly tucked the folded staff into his sash and ran forward. It wasn't long before Kasai came to the entrance of Master Shogar's chamber. Kasai was relieved to hear his old master inside. He rushed into the room. Master Shogar, I'm here. Kasai keeled over, trying to catch his breath. He put his hands on his knees for support. Master Shogar's back was to the door, and he was speaking to another monk. Ah, Brother Kasai, I'm glad you are here. Master Shogar said with a relaxed yet direct voice. Kasai still huffed. His lungs were on fire. He was amazed at how calm Master Shogar could be in such an intense situation. Master Kunshin says he had rallied the senior brothers to the left wall and brought the younglings to the food storage under the refectory. We must leave with all haste to join the fight. But Master Kunshin is dead, Kasai gasped between gulps of air. Tears streamed down his face. He's gone. Eyes can be deceived in the heat of battle, Brother Kasai. I assure you, I am very much alive, Master Kunshin said. The old master's head poked around the body of Master Shogar. He eyed Kasai suspiciously and promptly put some distance between the two monks. How could this be? He noticed there was something very wrong with Master Kunshin's face. His skin looked false, and his eyes held an expression of wickedness. Kasai was exhausted. His mind moved faster than his understanding could keep up. He gave up trying to figure things out. Unconsciously, he stripped away what was inconsistent with Master Kunshin and sought the truth. A black vapor materialized above Master Kunshin's head. Bewildered, Kasai stared in confused fascination. Was it just smoke? The dark mist formed into an unusual symbol. It pulsed outward in an erratic motion. Black tendrils reached out to strike the bright orange glow that had now appeared above Master Sugar's head. That was new. Master Kunshin, I'm sorry, I don't understand. How did you get here? What happened to you? Kasai said as he tried to gather his thoughts. Had he imagined seeing the murdered body of Master Kunshin? And what is that black symbol above your head? Master Shogar tilted his head to the side. You see a sigil, Brother Kasai? Tell me what you see immediately. Describe it to me, Master Shogar said his voice held unfamiliar urgency. His body tensed. I'm not sure what I'm seeing. There is a strange black room floating above Master Kunshin. I've never seen the like of it before. Is he sick, Master Sugar? Master Sugar's shoulders slumped, and his body deflated for a moment. You are correct, Brother Kasai. Master Kunshin is dead, Master Sugar said. This imposter is his assassin. Assassin? Kasai couldn't believe what he was hearing. He looked again at the man before him. How could this be? Master Kunshin began to take a few steps toward the open window, giving him a clear view of both monks. The weight of what had happened to Master Kunshin, Master Doi, and his brothers finally came to the forefront of Kasai's awareness like a rushing wave of fire. His fingers curled around Ninzazida segments at his waist. His heart pounded heavily as the fire zindu filled his body with anger, even fury. His mind went from asking too many questions to one focused answer. Hurt the one who hurt you. The enemy was now before him smiling like a spoiled child who had gotten his way. Ninza Zida was already in his hands. He gripped her two end segments and stretched the fire serpent in a defensive position, but one that could strike with ease. His mind filled with new and exotic attack sequences, combining the reach of the staff and his own body. A dominant force took control of his actions, just as a puppeteer manipulated a puppet. He did not think to resist the influence, only to act. Master, what are your orders? I'm ready. 
the thing that was Master Kunshan sized up Kasai. You are ready? And what is the little monk ready to do? Stop me when the two of the famed masters of Ordu could not. You are but a boy. Kasai heard the battle growing closer as shouts and footsteps advanced toward the chamber. Then Kasai recognized the familiar sound of padded sandals on the stone floor of the hallway. Your time is up. My brothers approach in numbers, Kasai said. His entire being wished to strike out that the creature, but his will remained steady. Master Shogar had yet to give his order. He was surprised by the aggression that filled his mind and the desire to engage in battle. His fire zindo had never blazed so fiercely. The impostor leaped to the windowsill, perched like a gargoyle on a ledge. Alas, I must bid you farewell. My time grows short, and I must be away on more pressing affairs. The image of Master Kunshin shifted out of focus and revealed something else, something shimmering and unnatural. The thing on the window ledge deftly tossed a small object to the floor. It exploded and filled the room with billowing smoke. Kasai shielded his eyes and began to cough, but his senses were on alert. He somehow heard the rapid deployment of numerous objects cutting through the air and heading in his direction. He reacted on instinct. Ninza Zita was a whirlwind of motion. Time slowed down before his eyes. The confusing nature of the smoke slowed to almost a standstill. Kasai saw the oncoming projectiles appear as large as bloated apples pushing through the smoke. Ninza Zita's outer sections deflected the darts with ease, sending broken pieces in all directions. Not one barb managed to penetrate Kasai's defense. Kasai heard Master Shoyu grunt in pain. Events in the room flashed back to real time. The assassin was gone. Master Shogar lay crumpled on the floor. Master Shogar! I shall be fine, Master Shogar said, but not without effort. He tried to stand. We must help the others. Get me up. Kasai did as he was asked. But Master Shogar remained unsteady without assistance. Master, what was that thing? What is it? Are you hurt? What happened? Master Shogar removed his robe from his left shoulder. He brushed away a small barb that was embedded in his flesh. The skin around the impact point had turned an ugly green with blisters bubbling around the edge. It appears I have been poisoned, Master Shogar said in a curious tone. His power tattoos flared as they sought to counter the toxins and repair the wounded flesh, but the skin blistered at a more rapid pace. But how? This wound is on your back. How could... Oh, no. I was not thinking of where the darts were going after I blocked them. Master, I am sorry. You defended yourself admirably, Master Shogar said. He looked toward the door with blind eyes. A small group of younger monks barreled into the small chamber. Their eyes were wide with fear. Many had encountered the enemy and had done their best to fight back. Their faces and hands were covered in cuts and bruises. Somehow they managed to escape the melee and had fled to the safety of the inner buildings. Master Shogar, Brother Kasai, the monastery is overrun. The buildings are burning and brothers are dying. What should we do? One of the younglings said. Kasai knew him as Brother Mika. Where are the others? Where are the senior brothers? Master Shogar asked in a strained voice. Whoever is left is fighting in the courtyard. Daku sent me to find all the masters. He needs help. I found brothers Tutu Nindus and the others in the meditation hall, Mika said. Take me to brother Daku. Have you seen Master Dore? Master Shogar said. We were hoping he was with you, Mika said. Brother Kasai will lead us to the courtyard. We shall lend our help where we can. Hopefully we will join with Master Dore along the way, Master Shogar said. But... Kasai decided to hold his tongue. He led the younger monks out of the chamber and toward the courtyard. Destruction was everywhere. The old wood of rafters crackled and popped as the fire ate into their core. Black chunks of wood fell to the floor, followed by filthy streams of charred smoke. The old monastery was crumbling around them. Kasai navigated a path through the burning debris. The monks often had to go back the way they came when collapsed ceilings prevented them from moving forward. Master Sugar brought up the rear. He spoke reassuring words to the younger brothers, but they were all moving too slow. Kasai wanted to tell Master Shogar of the death of Master Dori, but considered the information carefully. He did not want to create more panic in the younger monks. He was barely able to retain his courage himself, and could only imagine what was happening in the minds of the young ones. Their vacant eyes told him they were in the grips of a death fear. Kasai would tell Master Shogar about Master Dori later. Let me scout ahead and make sure it is safe. Kasai said to the others. 
He moved quickly down the hall and around a corner. Hopefully the way to the courtyard was clear. The corridor shook, as if it trembled with the same fear he felt in his heart. The air was thick and suffocating. Thoughts of his mother came back to his mind. He remembered being a small boy crying in the darkness. Then she was there, and he ran into her arms. They had become separated from his pa when the smoke and flame engulfed their own. A long groan, followed by deafening crack, which shook him from his dark thoughts. He retraced his steps around the corner and saw an entire section of the ceiling had crashed against the stone floor. Dread filled his heart. A tangled pile of burning wood, gray stone, and plaster was heaped in the middle of the corridor. Under the debris were the unmoving arms and legs of his brothers. No, no, no! Ksai cried. He frantically threw fiery pieces of the falling ceiling to the side. Everything was hot, and his hands soon blistered. Tears of frustration ran down his face. Master Sugar! Master Sugar! Kasai could not find the old monk. Cruel tongues of flame laughed at him as it burned through the wood. His brothers were gone. Kasai knew there was nothing to be done for them now. He had lost them all. How could he have missed the compromised ceiling? He could have prevented this if he had been paying more attention instead of thinking of himself. Now things were worse. Kasai saw movement beyond the rear of the pile. Master Sugar had fallen backward when the ceiling collapsed. He sat up straight and cocked his head to the ceiling. It looked like the master was meditating on communing with an unseen voice. I understand, Master Sugar said into the air. He slowly stood, using the wall for support. Kasai, you must escape to Getham. Go to the Temple of Illumination and find Grandmaster Nusulo. He must know what has occurred here. Our sister monasteries must be alerted to this danger, or the same faith will befall them. But what of the others? They need our help, Kasai said. The Boundless has set you on a different path. I shall gather as many as I can. I am afraid we have lost this day to darkness. There is a foul smell in the air. Somehow the Amaranthine barrier has been breached. Creatures from the Abyss have returned to the mortal realm. The Abyss? Kasai's heart sank as the magnitude of the word registered in his mind. He was reliving his worst fears. The monastery is lost. You must warn the others. Their salvation lies with you. Race now to the catacombs as quickly as you can. Master Sugar slumped against the wall. His breathing was shallow. Come, Master, Kasai said. Put your hand on my shoulder. I will not leave without you. Master Sugar smiled with understanding and nodded slowly. Together, they navigated the torn hallways toward the monastery's catacombs. Kasai grew increasingly worried. Master Shuria was getting weaker instead of stronger and needed frequent rest. They stopped behind a partially collapsed ceiling and wall. It provided excellent cover and a clear view out to the courtyard. The fire blazing through the monastery buildings lit the square. Kasai saw a small group of monks fighting off the invaders. Daku led the survivors, but the enemy grossly outnumbered them. One by one, the monks were captured in large nets and dragged to the side of the courtyard. Daku was the last to be caught. His wrists were bound and he was forced to kneel on the ground before the murderous assassin. The assassin conversed with a group of oversized men in loose clothing, resembling monks' robes. Kasai felt a shudder pass through the air. He smelled a pungent mix of sulfur and cinnamon which permeated the ash-filled air. There was a blinding flash and a lift otherworldly creature materialized into the courtyard. She had a feminine form and was both dazzling and deadly to behold. Kasai could not look away. He had read of different types of demon kind in the monastery library. This creature was a succubus, seductive and deadly. The demon shunned modesty and was naked from the waist up. She wore form-fitted leather leggings which hung low and tight on her slender hips. The demon did truly little to cover her seductive curves. Bone-straight onyx hair shot down her alabaster skin and glistened like black oil running down her sheet of ice. She marched straight toward the assassin. He bowed cockily in her presence like some flamboyant minstrel in the presence of royalty. Is this all that remains? She growled. And an excellent evening to you too, Sestra, the assassin said with a pompous smile. The demon slapped him hard across the face. The killer fell fast to the dirt. 
the monks were meant to be collected and unharmed until tested, Sestra said. Our mistress will be furious with what you have done here, Dax. My orders were to remove the masters. I will not be blamed for the action of Maugras's mindless vor. They were created to distraction only. I cannot be held accountable for their bloodlust. The succubus looked at what remained of the Brotherhood. And was their success. My dear sister, you wound me. Success, of course. All but one master is no more. The third will be dead soon. He will not be able to resist the unique poison in his veins. I was referring to them, Sestra looked past Dax. She sauntered over to the bound brothers in a provocative yet predatory manner. Now, let us see if something can be salvaged from this tobacco. Sestra moved through the captives. She spun a small amulet over each of their heads. Kasai saw a flash of green every time the stone at its center caught the light of the fires. What is she doing? he whispered, but new Master Shogar would be unable to answer. He feared she was deciding which of his brothers would be taken as slaves and which would be killed as sacrifices to unholy gods. He forced himself to stay hidden and quiet. Sestra moved through the group, clearly disappointed. She looked back at the assassin. It will not go well for you if he's already dead. Sestra stopped and turned back to Daku. That one. Pull him from the rest. Daku was separated from the group. He looked at her with a mixture of anger, awe, and blatant desire. As Sestra gave Daku a flirtatious smile as she slithered in his direction. Carnal delight oozed from her movements. She halted a few meters from him and tossed a wicked-looking dagger at his knees. You pick that up, Sestra said in a commanding voice. Daku picked up the dagger between both hands. He looked questioning at the succubus. You're different from the rest. I can smell it. I would wager that no one here sees your true potential as I do. There is a certain glint in your eyes that hold promise for greatness to come. I offer you a choice. No longer will you be shackled beneath all this hypocrisy. Sestra waved her hands about the burning monastery. You shall be transformed into a champion among champions. Yours shall be a life of conquest. You shall have the power which only one such as I can grant. You will come with me and experience all that you desire. And in return, Laku said, Ah, yes, everything must have a price. All I have said shall be yours when you slit the throat of every one of these miserable monks. The choice is yours. Shall it be one final stand for Ordu? Will you fight beside your brothers and friends? Or will you choose freedom without consequence? The Vor, as Dax had called him, chuckled with deep guttural malice. Daku flipped the dagger backward in his hands and sliced through the leather straps binding his wrists. He then drove the blade into the ground and rubbed the circulation back into his hands. Daku survey the position of the enemy around him. When the coup attacked, Kasai would use the distraction to join his friends. Maybe together they could push the creatures back and free the others. That was a long shot, but worth a try. Ninze's Zida felt warm in his hands. The coup flipped the dagger into the air and caught it in a firm grip, then turned and thrust the blade into Brother Hondu's chest. Kasai gasped and quickly covered his mouth. Daku methodically worked his way through the group of shocked and helpless brothers. Risona fell next, then Brother Dani, Jonah, and Newman. Daku didn't stop until only two remained. Kasai clenched his teeth, keep from yelling. He turned away from the grisly sight. Daku, what have you done? He whispered with his head low. Kasai then heard the voice of Jeresco yell above the din of burning buildings. Have you lost your mind? Kasai looked back. Jeresko was kneeling in the dirt. Tears ran down the sides of his face as Daku stalked toward him. Times have changed. I finally see real power in front of me. I'm sick of the masters brainwashing me and telling me there is a boundless that will grant me power. It's all a hoax. Ordo is a lie, Daku said. She's a demon, Jeresko yelled. Demon? Can you not see her? She's a goddess. I see her, I see her so clearly, 
Dacou said. He was speaking to himself as he stared at Sestra in a daze. It is not too late, Dacou. Cut us loose, Cannonball said. Dacou was momentarily broken from his swoon. He looked again at Cannonball and Juresco. No, today is an unlucky day for you. Today, the strong survive. The weak perish. It is the natural way of things. Dacou wore a wicked smile and deftly slit the throat of Brother Juresco. Plus, I never liked you. Goodbye, Cannonball. Dacou stabbed your armor in the chest. A fountain of blood followed the knife's blade when he ripped the dagger out of the chubby monk's body. Dacou walked up to Sestra and placed the dagger back in her hands. I accept. He glanced back at the carnage he had reaped. He was satisfied with his work. They were never my brothers, and certainly not my friends. Sestra handed the dagger back to him. No, my lovely pet. Keep this as a symbol of our trust. Your ascension shall be glorious. She looked past Daku and straight toward the location where Kasai and Master Shoyer had taken refuge. Kasai quickly ducked back behind the debris. He prayed he had not been seen. Master, we must go, Kasai said. And Master Shoger nodded. We shall gather some traveling supplies and make for the monastery catacombs. If we are lucky, we will reach the wilderness without incident, Master Shoker said. Kasai supported him as they walked away. Master Shoker's face was white. Kasai knew the chances were slim to none that they would make it outside the monastery walls alive. Lucky, 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 Kasai said to himself. Thirteen. Shiverick. Duke Shiverick unrolled a map that showed the foothills of the Cereba Mountains in southern Barokia. The passage to the mountains via the Cereba Pass was marked in red. It wasn't the only entryway into the kingdom of Sunni, but it was the safest. Shiverick would see Barokia strong again, and he had plans, but he was woefully short of allies. He stroked the three-day stubble on his cleft chin as his eyes drifted to the northern kingdom. Dense forests filled the central regions of Barokia as roads and rivers wound throughout the realm. It was a civilized land, thanks to the will and vision of House Shiverick and its long line of rulers. He reached for another map. It depicted the northern borderlands of Barokia and beyond to the kingdom of Tross, where Maugris stayed cooped up in his fortress of rock and snow, plotting his revenge. Shiverick sucked at his teeth. Maugris. What to do about Maugris? His maps were made of boar's hide. It proved a strong material that accepted script and design work without the ink bleeding through to its backside. The Duke favored these maps. They were part of his family's history, as much as Volcarim Keep. The maps were heirlooms passed down as relics of honor from father to son, dating back to the founding of Barokia. They had traveled with him through blood, mud, and victory. More charts were rolled out over a long table made from a single slab of thick red oak. Shiverick was obsessed with the details of any campaign, no matter the size or scope. He assessed his troop deployments, where the land provided natural choke points and areas for swifter movements of the infantry and war engines. The more significant frontier settlements were also displayed in graphic detail. Shiverick turned to ponder a larger map tacked to the wall behind him. It showed a detailed description of the vast grasslands that spread throughout northern Barokia. A box was drawn on the map just south of the sloping foothills of the Hoarfrost Mountains. It symbolized an old military base, used mostly for war games and training, called the Last Garrison. It had hard memories for Shiverick, memories he intended to erase. He then traced a path with his finger through the Hoarfrost Mountain along Stormwind Pass. The route led to Raklash Fortress, Maugris's stronghold. Could the sorcerer be trusted? That was a question Shiverick could not answer with confidence. No matter, he would put together overlapping contingency plans to ensure the outcome of events followed his design. He turned back to the maps on the table and clasped his muscular arms behind his back. He would tighten his hold on the outer villages throughout Barokia and secretly draft more conscripts to his cause, not Conrad's. Peasants could choose to live outside of the walls of the kingdom and the politics within, 
but soon they would need to side with one power or the other. Either way, they would be consumed in the war to come. My duke, I came as soon as I heard the word. Dax has returned, Malachi said as he scurried into the study. Ordu has fallen. All have been slain. Duke Shiverick looked upon his arch -vashim. The man's body appeared to be more bent than straight. His face had developed blotches of a purplish nature. It was clear he hadn't slept in days. His lower right arm was wrapped in leather bindings and ended in a mean iron stump. Malachi was a haggard mess. And the demon? Shivering inquired. Words like demon came too easily to his lips in recent weeks. He didn't like it. It was a sour alliance, but a necessary one until he could control the might of the kingdom. Malachi became crestfallen upon hearing the name of his unrequited love. This was becoming a problem. I fear I do not know. Sestra travels when and where she will. She leaves without warning and returns the same. I am wary of the time you spend with your dark charges. Our guests are not toys or baubles for your fancy. When they have served their purpose, they will be removed. Shivery took a hard look at his adviser in the light. You look unwell. Malachi's mood brightened at the mention of the demon kind at Volcarum Keep. My duke, they have so much to offer us, and not just the vor spawned from Draklash Fortress. The lesser fiends that have been summoned for Gathos have so many secret things they are willing to tell and do. Fascinating creatures. Malachi absent-mindedly brought his left hand to the stump at his right, caressing the edges of iron. I see, Shivrick said. He did nothing to hide his contempt. Until the disposition of these creatures can be accurately assessed, I do not want you to bring them any closer than you must. Sestra speaks in syrupy riddles. Dax is too polite to be trusted, and these vor are now everywhere. Keep yourself clean of their taint until this is over. Of course, my lord, it shall be as you will. Did I hear someone mention my sweet name? Dax said. The assassin glided into the study. Shiver took note that a young man dressed in dirty robes trailed behind him, not a prisoner, but also not a companion. Where did you find this one? Malachi said. By the looks of him, I'd say vagabond traveler or monk hopeful for the Temple of Illumination, and one in need of a bath. His face scrunched in disgust from an imagined foul smell. Ah, yes, a proper introduction, then. I present to you Daku. No last name, or none that the lad wishes to give me. Uh, so let us call him Daku of Ordu. A one-time monk, and now an extended agent of the mistress. We remain hopeful, at least, Dak said. He brushed off some dirt from Daku's shoulder and fussed over his robes. Well, as can be, I suppose. Come here, boy, Shiverick said. He was impatient to know why a monk from Ordo had survived the culling and was brought to his keep. The coup moved with fluid ease away from Dax and presented himself to the duke. He drew back his shoulders and kept a rigid posture. From Ordo? How is it that you came to be here? Shiverick said. I decided it was in my best interest to walk a different path than those at Ordo, Daku said. You see, Morse truth is spoken for one of eight than his own. The demigod is truly dead, Malachi said. He jumped forward with keen interest. The change of Moore reveals the truth in all things. He stabbed a bony finger into Daku's chest. Even you! Daku raised an indifferent eyebrow. He then fixed his dark eyes on Shiverick. Daku had the same relaxed reserve as the Grand Master had during their failed negotiations. Malachi, calm yourself. Give the boy some room, Shivrig said. His arch Vashim's fanaticism with more was becoming more pronounced since the arrival of the demons. If it clouded his judgment, Shivrig would need to remove him. Malachi bowed. Yes, my duke. Grumbled something more as he passed Aku, but moved to the side. I am not interested in more or Aethanos. Either will do or pick another. I care not. I need more able-bodied men under my banner, not the rantings of new worlds to come by another self-inflated prophet, Shivrick said. Which are you? It was a test. What information had Dax let pass through his lips on the long journey back to Gethem? 
For now, Shivering would consider the boy a spy until proven otherwise. A monk's true power comes from mind over matter. By using a focused determination of will, one can separate the illusion of mental pain from what is, in reality, only physical sensation. A new reality then blossoms within the discipled mind when this basic principle has been mastered. Deities and demigods are inconsequential to my abilities. Stories of more or eight than us are meant to control the masses. They do not grant magical favors to the faithful. Malachi's eager expression dropped into a menacing glare. You will become part of the change of more or perish, Shivrick frowned. Duke Shivrick, I can be of value. The monks of Ordu were found homeless on the streets of desperate neighborhoods across the lands of Barokia. They were orphaned or abandoned at an early age. They have nothing. Feed them, shelter them, and an enemy to focus their anger on, and your ranks will swell. I shall recruit and train them myself. An army of street rats, pretending to be monks of lost Ordu, Malachi scoffed. Daku's eyes narrowed. Do not push me, old man. The boy has courage and pride. I can use both, Shivrik thought. Dax came to Daku's side and patted him on the back. The assassin was quick to change the subject. The boy certainly has spirit and a favorable conscience to your cause. He's strong as a bull and not without a quick, fiery fist. Quite the fighter when cornered, mind you. He managed to hold his own against some unpleasant disagreement with my entourage along the way to Volcarum Keep. Plus, our dear Sestra has taken him into her trust. As a plaything or informant, there was more to this young man than just an afterthought or memento from a raid. He was here for a reason. Now where is the little bird? She's constantly fluttering here and there, yet I am not privy to her movements, Shiverick said. Sestra appeared like a ghost from the shadows of a forgotten corner of the room. Sulphur and cinnamon followed in her wake. The monasteries of the four orders have fallen. The monks are gone. Hardly the fight I expected. It was all quite disappointing. Shivrick heard a slight sigh come from Malachi. The archfreshim rushed to fawn over Sestra. He reached his good hand out to touch her. What did I say about touching me again, worm? Sestra growled. Malachi immediately pulled back his hand. I only wish to welcome our wayward dove back to the keep. Sestra's upper lip curled. She gave Malachi a sidelong glare when she passed him. I'm already in a foul enough mood without listening to your weak drivel. She drew close to Dax. I was able to test the monks properly this time. None passed. Daku pushed forward to stand in front of Sestra. I did what you said. I want what was promised. Ah, my young monk, I have not forgotten about you. Sestra raised an amulet with an emerald center above his head. There was a flicker, but then the stone went dark. She sighed. Still nothing. Shivering sensed the frustration hanging from Sestra's typically alluring features. There was another storyline in play. Sekka's real interest in this campaign was taking shape with each piece she moved into place. Malgris seemed content enough to watch those that made him an outcast suffer, but the archdevil and her thralls were up to something entirely different. I said, I want... Daku started again. I do not care what you want, Sestra barked at Daku. She turned back to Dax. Were all the monks within the walls of Odo during the raid? Could any have escaped? The succubus was fire and fury in a moment's notice. She was unbridled passion. How would I know? I was busy disposing of the masters, Dax said. Who was missing? Sestra screamed. She rounded on Daku. You were in the courtyard. You saw them all die. Who wasn't there? His eyes went wide with surprise. I, I don't know. Let me think. Daku looked left and right. Kasai wasn't there, Daku said at last. He was absent in the refectory at last bell. I did not see him in the holding area either. He might have been outside the monastery he was during the attack. Daku softly chuckled. I knew it. Late for his own funeral. Ah, it seems this Kasai may have eluded us. Sestra eased back to her provocative demeanor. Kasai. She gently breathed the name through her teeth. Such a 
peaceful name, like a field of long grass blowing in a gentle breeze. The succubus stretched out her arm and walked her slender alabaster fingers up Daku's tattered sleeve. Could Kasai do anything interesting? Any tricks? Sestra purred into Daku's ear. He was average. I could best him in the sparring circles with ease. I once engaged four other brothers simultaneously. I defeated them all. I even fought against a master. I was next in line to... Not you! She cuffed him across the back of his head. I examined every monk within the monastery walls. Dead or alive, the amulet did not respond. Not so much as a glimmer. But I did not think to look to the outer reaches. My advanced scouts did not speak of monks being late with their chores. Sestra exchanged a quizzical glance with Dax. Shivered let the plot unfold as each piece fell into place. It was valuable information he could use to his benefit in the future, once he understood its meaning. I will ask you again. Did your Kasai do anything special? Sestra said her impatience was on the rise. Well, he did complete something I couldn't, but I'm sure he cheated, Daku reluctantly said under his breath. And what was that? Sestra said. He completed the trial of pillars. Sestra looked at Dax for an explanation. The assassin shrugged his shoulders. It's a mace in the sky. An initiate follows a circuit of columns by jumping the top of one to the next, Daku said. Not much of a test. Sestra said, I presume you monks were capable of feats of this nature. Daku rolled his eyes. Not if you're blind to where the next column stood. It's more of a mental test than a physical one. Kasai was good, but not that good. Even I could not finish the route. The test is designed to be impossible for anyone a master to complete. Could it be he had someone watching over him? A guardian angel, perhaps? Sestra's excitement mounted. Tell me more. Tell me everything. The purring had returned. What do you want to know? Kasai was soft. He had green eyes that changed color according to his mood. I don't know. He loved to protect the weak. I tried to tell him only the strong survive in this world, but he wouldn't listen. Dax sidled up to Sestra and spoke in a conspirator's tone. Kasai was the name of the monk who interfered before I could finish off the last master. He saw through my glamour and alerted the blind one to my identity. Sestra wore a devious smile. He is the one, she said with conviction. Kasai? What does he matter? He's a nobody. You said I was special. The cool looked forlorn. Shivering wondered if the fool was in love with the succubus. That would be a mistake. He feigned boredom with the conversation. Assassin, please explain why any of this is of interest to me in any way. Because, Duke Shiverig, our lovely Sestra speaks of the coming of the next ever hero. The mistress has made it clear that she wants the avatar of Aethanos for her own in the north, Dax said. Bad news for her if he was a monk, Shiverig said. He picked up a map from his desk and studied it to hide his surprise. Could it be true? Had Sekka entered the mortal realm? Kasai, the ever hero? Don't make me laugh. Kasai wouldn't let his shadow be seen if he didn't have permission first. He's been a milk baby since I met him at Ordu. He's no hero, Daku said. He crossed his arms over his chest. You have the wrong person. Shiver took a hard look at Dax. Was it true? Had the fool Malgris successfully summoned the devil to the mortal realm? Assuming he had, why would she need the ever-hero alive? It didn't make sense. Maugris wanted the monks of Athens dead. Who could blame him? History showed them to be a troublesome lot, and Sekka would be smart to be rid of them as well. If Athenos was truly gone, then who would be left to oppose her? Better to have the ever-hero dead as well. But she had other plans. She needed the ever-hero alive for something special, but for what? This question lingered in his mind, as it is wondering on who was the real power in the north. A storm was coming, one that King Conrad would never be able to weather on his own. Unfortunately, Shiverig was not strong enough to defend the land without absolute control over the five armies. If a demonic invasion were imminent, 
he would need to consider his position in the aftermath. There were always weak links to any well-planned strategy. Perhaps a partnership with Seca, not Maugris, was necessary, until the proper moment to counterattack presented itself. Focus on one enemy at a time, while keeping them all in mind. I am not some dullard keen on prophecies or peasant stories of salvation from the unseen divide. I care not if the monks have gone from the mountains, grasslands, hills, or hovels where they hid. Can we finally move forward as planned? Shiverick said. He deliberately acted as if he was none the wiser of the real motives of his infernal guests. What about me and the promises you made me? I want the power you spoke of at the monastery. Daku grabbed Sester by the shoulder to pull her around. He failed to do anything but elicit a sharp hiss from the succubus. Then a sensual smile came to her lips. In time, you will have ample opportunity to prove your worth, Sestra said. The demon did not try to hide her desire for Daku. It was clear she had other plans for the young man. I have real worth right now. I can show you. Sestra ignored Daku. She turned to Dax. Take Magris's vor and scour the mountainside foothills and forests. Find any remaining monks that could have been outside the walls of Ordu. Bring them here. We want the one named Kasai. I'll wager he did not escape our trap alone. He is our priority. Keep him alive. You'll never find him, Daku said. Not without my help. We found our way to your hidden sanctuary easy enough. I'm sure we can manage, Sestra said. It's obvious the order was betrayed. However, the paths Kasai now walks are known only by the monks at Ordu. And unless you can brace the dead, you'll need a guide. I see. Which makes you conveniently indispensable. How timely. Sestra eyed Daku with suspicious doubt. How do I know this is not some trick to protect Kasai? Kasai betrayed me, Daku said. Shivrik heard the threat in the boy's tone. He was beginning to appreciate the lad. The boy was born into the wrong house, Dax said, full of mirth. His laughter circled to Shivrick, remained stoic. Let me show you my loyalty once more. Let me lead your pack of hunters. I know Kasai. He will come running when he sees a friendly face. Then you will have your price, and I will have my reward. The young monk grew bolder now that he had the succubus attention. He didn't know the game he played with the demon. She was toying with him. I have no patience to wait while you bumble around the woods. And more so, there is no way a mortal could lead a host of demon kind. You'd be ripped to shreds the moment Dax's back was turned. I held my own against them before. Cesar gave Daku a quaint smile. They were playing with you? You are not ready. There is much in you that would need to change. She walked away, throwing Daku a teasing pout over her shoulder. Kasai shall not escape. We have all the information we need. Dax cleared his throat. Uh, if we are finished here, I shall be on my way. Wait! Daku cried. He looked uncertain. How? How would I need to change? Be careful of what you ask for, monk, Shiverick said. Oh, hush, Duke Shiverick. You'll scare the boy. I won't need much. Just a bit of his soul, Sestra said. Well, to be honest, I'll need all of it. My soul? You want my soul? Shivering saw Daku try to step back, but Sestra was quickly within his intimate space. She twined herself around him before he could create any distance. Oh, do was a lie. Aethanos is gone and left his monks with nothing. And you have no use for deities and demigods, remember? Why worry about something so intangible as a soul? <laughs> they are overrated at best. Live a life of greatness now. The cold dirt of death offers no salvation, divine or otherwise. Sestra whispered lie upon lie in his ear. Shivering watched and waited. There may be a way if you are strong enough, Sestra said. She pushed herself away from Daku. But I doubt it. Mortals are made of weak stock. I'm strong. You said I was different. In your body, perhaps, but we shall see if your soul also has the strength of your conviction. If you are found worthy, you will prevail. If not, well, your soul was not worth the etheric energy it was given in the first place. No, not my soul. Take something else instead. Daku became defensive. Shivrick studied the young monk. He was fit and fearless unto this point, 
a supple fighter with a brawler's mentality. He was an easy target to manipulate when his passions rose. This was an opportunity to gather sorely lacking information about the demon's abilities. The boy had betrayed his order and was now of no use to the duke, except maybe as an experiment. You boast prowess and worth. You demand respect. And yet, when given the solution to attain your goal, you refuse. Strong words fill you, but they are empty. You're just a frightened young boy. Send the assassin about his business. Have him find the monk Kasai or the ever hero, whatever. I tire of this drama. If the boy has no more use to you, then get rid of him. But it's my soul. What better raw material to use to build a new you? Maybe the duke is right. You are not ready for such advancement, Sestra said. She dismissed the idea and turned to the assassin. No more mistakes, Dax. If Kasai's the one the mistress desires, he must not be harmed. Shivrig watched a coup closely. The boy was exhausted and probably hadn't had a solid meal in days. A decision of impatience and ill consequence was about to be made by the youngster. I'll do it. I'll do what you ask, Naku said. He stepped forward and stood proud. Sestra was once again at the boy's side, purring in his ear. A wise decision. You shall be magnificent. The mortals of this world shall bow down in your presence. Before Daku could say another word, she deftly placed a white pearl into his mouth. Now swallow. Hmm? She gave him a passionate kiss and pushed the pearl deeper into his mouth. Shivrick folded one of his arms across his barrel chest, and with the other raised his hand to stroke the sides of a rough mustache. A need to shave, he idly thought. Something would happen soon. He was not wrong. My body feels warm and filled with energy. Is that what you feel? Daku said. His eyes were wide with amazement. He stretched his body and curled his hands into fists. I feel strong. Fat droplets of sweat formed on his forehead and freely flowed down his face. He looked at his arms and nodded. Yes, I feel it, just like you promised. Blue veins rose to the surface of his exposed skin and pumped hot blood throughout his body. Daku's dark eyes turned pink, and his sandy brown skin became pale. Yes, but not quite like I promised. The demon seed has taken hold, Sestra purred. She watched the transformation evolve. Humans are frail compared to the vigor of demon kind. This is only the beginning. Daku held an eager expression. More. I want more. Oh, it is coming, Sestra said. The duke remained skeptical. Nothing but the infernal born was straightforward or free. A price must always be paid. It's wonderful. I feel... Wait, I, I feel cold. Why am I cold? There's pain. Shivering watched as Daku deliberately slowed his breathing. He chanted foreign words. Umtare tutare. Ture sua, um tare tu tare, ture sua, um tare tu tare, ture sua. Shiver assumed it was a mantra to go beyond the pain. It wasn't working. The coup's hands trembled. He clamped down on his temple as if to hold his head together. So much pressure. The pain. Pain is too much. I've changed my mind. I don't want this, Daku pleaded. Make it stop. But this is what you wanted, she said with syrupy innocence. Sestra stepped back. She watched the young monk's torment with knowing eyes. Daku's wailing shifted to screams. He dropped to his knees, hunched over from the pain. Malachi's eyes widened, and his head inched forward to take in more of Daku's suffering. The arch licked his dry lips. Shivering grabbed him by the collar and pulled him back. Daku from Ordu was doomed. Shivering hoped the mess would be minimal. He stood protectively in front of his table of maps as an eerie silence came over the monk. The room waited. A deep gurgle resonated from within the monk and turned into a horrible laugh. Daku's pink eyes darted around the room as if looking for an escape. The monk's body expanded, muscles stretched, ripped, and grew anew. 
bones cracked and broke, then reformed to support something bigger. Naku's torso convulsed. Blood vomited from his mouth and sprayed across the floor. He tore off his robes as if they were anathema to his new form. His spine budged along his back, then sharp-edged bone tore through his pale skin as each vertebrae swelled and popped back into place. Daku's body grew into the shape of something cruel and vile, where the young monk once knelt was now a beast of ash and muscle and short white fur. A pale-skinned demon raised itself from the floor. A final, whimpering gasp seeped out of its mouth. Sestra approached the pale demon and laid her hand upon his impressive physique. Welcome, Kalkoroth, shadow demon of Gathos. The demon was massive, standing eight feet tall. It resembled the basic human features of Daku, but took on the thick musculature and size of an arctic bear. Kalkaroth's stout muzzle filled with needle-sharp teeth. Instead of paws, the creature had long fingers that flexed in the open air. The leftover debris of Daku's torn and tattered skin hung from Kalkaroth's hard body. The pale demon grabbed the husk and threw the membrane to the floor. A black vapor trailed from Kalkaroth's body as it moved about in its new form. The demon's face shifted back to the image of Daku. His pink eyes turned dark. Help me, a meek and distant voice said. Kalkaroth roared, and the pale demon's visage returned. A viscous lather coated its lips. Pink eyes glared in anger. This one has a strong will, but he will not escape me. Kalkaroth's voice rumbled through his throat. It sounded like boulders grinding beneath the weight of a mountain. Kalkaroth coughed twice. He vomited a thick mass of bodily fluids and tissues. The mess flowed down his chin and over his smooth chest. He wiped the remains of Daku off his face and smeared it over Sestra's mouth. The sucker was licked her lips. She provocatively rubbed her body over the pale demon's groin like an animal in heat. Kalkaroth grabbed Sestra and took her in front of Shiverig and the arch regime. It was brutal and savage. The duke was mildly amused. Malachi's pallor became ghost-white. He looked confused and hurt. Thankfully, their rutting was over quickly. The demon's lust spilled out of his erect member and puddled on the floor. Did you enjoy that, Daku? Sestra whispered in Kalkaroth's ear. I know you can still experience the world around you through Kalkaroth's senses. Such are the gifts I give you. Kalkaroth momentarily shifted back into the resemblance of Daku, albeit a brutish version of the former monk. There was a visible struggle in the boyish face mixed with determination. Kalkaroth reasserted control, and the boy was reluctantly vanquished. It appeared that two beings wrestled for control of the shared soul. The monk had some fight in him. Perhaps if the boy was strong enough, he could be of use as an informant. How to communicate with him without the beast knowing would be something to consider later. Yes, little monk, your thoughts and memories are known to me. It shall be a pleasure tormenting a follower of Antinos. You will be helpless to watch the destruction I wreak upon this land. Kalkaroth's deep voice filled the room. Kalkaroth glared at Shiverick, assessing the level of threat posed by the duke. He then sniffed Malachi. A feral grin grew on his snout. What of these mortals? Are they food for Kalkaroth? I have great hunger. I wish to feast on their flesh. Shivrik heard a faint gasp escape from Malachi's lips. These are friends, Kalkaroth. You will treat them as such, Sestra said. She playfully winked at Shivrik. Kalkaroth stepped close to Shivrik and took in his scent. The duke knew battle lost when he saw it. Kalkaroth was eager for violence. This was a challenge. Shiverick remained composed. Sestra wedged herself between the two, purposefully placing her hands on Shiverick's chest. 
she gave the pale demon a stern look. Remember, Kalkaroth? Friends. Kalkaroth gave shivering a smirk. Yes, friends. Now, there is one called Kasai that is of utmost importance to the mistress. He must be handled with care. You'll find his identity within the soul memories of your host. Cesra twisted around, brushing her hard backside against Shiverick. She handed Kalkaroth an emerald amulet. What of this trinket? Kalkaroth held the amulet in front of his face. Keep it for now. The mistress said it would find its rightful bearer soon. And in the meantime, I want you to stay here and watch for our quarry. I suspect if Kasai escaped our net again, he will make his way to the holy temple in the city. If you get bored, look to the priests for entertainment. Kalkaroth's pink eyes shifted to Malachi, and a wicked smile curled at the edges of his snout, drool dripped in long strands from his jaws. That I will. Shivering was unimpressed with the spectacle. He was more concerned about the loyalties and allegiances of the demons and devils entering his lands. And what a view, assassin. You do not seem to have the mark of frost upon you, Shivering said. Duke Shivering, I am not from the frost plain of Gathos, nor any of the deeper layers of the abyss. I hail from the mortal plain, same as you. He is a Campion, a cross-bred mongrel. Kalkaroth snorted with contempt. The mistress keeps him only as a curious freak. Campion? Yes, my dear duke. I am what the pale demon says. A campion. I was spawned from the union of a changeling demon and a mortal. My childhood was uneventful until my powers matured, and I began to shift from one form to another. I had no control as a youth. What child does? My mother and I lived in a small village. The townsfolk did not take kindly to my extraordinary ability. The village preacher labeled my mother as a sonny's witch. He tortured her within a sliver of her life, then put her to the fire. Her screams through the night were enough to turn any kind soul black. Yet you survived. Dax shrugged his shoulders. I ran and hid. Of course. You hid like a coward. There's too much human in you. A true demon spawn would have destroyed his enemies. I would not have rested until I slaked my thirst for revenge with their blood, Kalkaroth said. He let the excited drool fall from the corners of his mouth. Dax ignored the pale demon's taunts. My mind was filled with fear. I ran into the forest and transformed from one animal to another. I blended into the woods with ease. The pursuit of the villagers was short-lived. I scraped out a meager existence in the forest. I tried to survive by thieving and hunting small game. Alas, I was not successful. Fortunately, a band of forest brigands took me. They saw my ability as a gift rather than a curse. They trained me how to steal properly and, of course, how to kill. I excelled at the latter. And the villagers who put your mother to the fire? Shivered's curiosity in the Campion story was piqued. Dax's eyes gleamed back at Shivering. One by one, they turned on each other. I had them utterly convinced their loved ones had committed horrible deeds. More firewood, they said. I took a certain satisfaction in hearing the pleas of denial and innocence from the preacher. This was some years later, after I had mastered my shape-shifting craft. And so we come to the present. How did you become Seca's killer? As I developed my talents, I realized I was better off on my own. The small band of thieves I ran with thought otherwise. They felt I owed them a debt. They threatened to kill me if I tried to leave. Perhaps I did owe them something, Dax reflected for a moment. Nonetheless, I killed them all. Of course, talents of my proclivity attract notice. Eventually, Sestra found me. She encouraged me to meet her mistress. The rest is history. He has no loyalty. He moves with the wind. Campions cannot be trusted. Kalkaroth growled out the words. Oh, and you can be trusted, my foul friend. 
Dax laughed. Why do you think the mistress keeps you locked up in a little pearl? <laughs> do not mock me, changeling. Kakaroth's voice turned savage. The pale demon's pink eyes looked to the side, as if distracted by another's words in his ears. Kalkaroth's face shifted momentarily to the visage of Daku, but then stopped back to that of the demon. The young monk was still fighting for possession of his soul. Come, Kalkaroth, we have preparations to make. Dax is just teasing you, Sestra said. The commanding nature of her voice was at odds with her childlike size. Kalkaroth stomped off behind her with a frustrated gruff. Good, good, thought Shivrick. Kalkaroth's lack of control was something he could manipulate. Once he found the right levers to pull, he is the one to watch, Dax said. Indeed he is. Fourteen. Sekka. Sekka brooded with cold attachment as she walked down barren corridors deep within the bowels of Racklash Fortress. The binding Malgris had laid upon her was proving to be more difficult to unwind than she initially expected, and her latest attempts had left her in a toxic mood, much to the misery of her unfortunate slaves. Sekka had cunningly crafted the magic herself and given the finished summoning spell and subsequent binding knowledge to her trusted succubus, Sestra, who was to deliver it to Margris in such a way as for him to think he was the original creator. It was a simple thing to accomplish and a mere child's play for Sestra. It was a necessary precaution, since Margris was incapable of weaving the correct path through the amaranthine barrier with his limited understanding of deep magic. Left to his own devices, he would have caused her to be torn to shreds while attempting to pull her through the barrier. The spell was laced with loopholes and trapdoors she could exploit later. Margaret had discovered the obvious inconsistency in the spell and removed them, as she knew he would. But the more obscure ones remained in place. Yet countering the core magic of the spell was proving to be more difficult than she initially predicted. Could the amaranthine barrier have contributed unique threads that strengthened the binding portion of the spell? She reminded herself that this had been the only way. If she had tampered too much with any part of the spell, it would become unstable and corrupted, and cast her who knows where. In time, she would divine the weakest thread within the spell, or within Malgris, and pull it. Still, it was an insult to her majesty that she was his to command. Sekka entered her scrying chamber. A stand with a basin filled with water was in the center of the room. The air was stale and heavy, as if the basin's enriched waters had recently been used to speak to an ally or spy upon a distant adversary. Was Margris watching her? Margris's obsession with her had become unbearable. The fool thought he was going to allow her to be by his side once the conquest of the Three Kingdoms was complete. Such were the hopeless delusions of mortals who overreached their abilities. Sekka approached the stand and looked down at the basin with contempt. She loathed the need for such aid to communicate with her minions mentally. But until she was completely free of Margaret's binding spell, she had no choice but to use the tools at her disposal. She spoke dark words in the language of Gathos and parted the water with both hands. The water turned to slush as it folded back over itself. Her fingers traced patterns in the icy film covering the surface. Arcane designs floated lazily in the air and disappeared. Show me Lord Oziax. Seca concentrated on the image of her general, and soon the demon warlord appeared in the slush. Oziax walked in his human form through a crowd of her minions from Gathos. He held the regal stature of an aristocrat, with finely polished and elegant features, high cheekbones, and a chiseled jaw. Long alabaster-hued hair flowed from his head and spread luxuriously over an oversized fur coat. The remains of arctic wolves, snow rabbits, and white winter elks, hunted for food north of the Hoarfrost Mountains, now composed the bulk of his coat. The animals were frozen in place, and added a macabre design to his mortal apparel. The antlers, claws, and teeth of the dead beasts jutted out from the fur coat like warped bristles. 
Under the coat, he had donned form-fitting white leather armor, covered in strange designs and deeply engraved runes of brilliant blue. The massive rune sword, Ice Horror, hung on his hip. It was sheathed in the stretched hide of an abyssal Jolgoth. The encased blade radiated an intense cold, which froze the moisture from the air. A white trail of crystal flakes followed him as he moved. Lord Oziax, align your senses with mine. I want to enjoy the impending raid. My mood is sour. Seca's thoughts invaded Osiax's mind. As you wish, my queen. Osiax's reply resonated in her mind. Seca felt a connection of Osiax's position become stronger. The walls of the scrying chamber faded away and were replaced by hundreds of straight and tall asher pine, with grayish grooved bark and twisted branches sprouting clumps of long needles. Late afternoon I had turned to dusk across the hoarfrost mountains. The crisp air and fresh smell of pine sap offended her senses. Her mind was carried forward as the pine trees raced past her in a blur. She descended from the high plateaus and into the lower foothills, where blackwood cotton trees, red chestnuts, and burr oaks grew in abundance. The stubborn deciduous trees still held on to their leaves, refusing to relinquish the colorful bounty to winter's gray sleep. The musky smell of autumn surrounded her. Crickets could be heard tuning for the nightly chorus. The forest floor was covered in a mulch blanket of red, orange, and brown. Sickening, she thought. Soon this land will feel the wondrous touch of Gothel's chill and be buried under ice and snow. Osiak now stood at the head of a demonic horde, waiting just inside the tree-lined perimeter of a small hunting village. He uttered a harsh word, and Frost gathered on the ground under the feet of the horde. With a wave of his hand, the icy crystals crawled forward toward the village. A foul spray of mist followed, and then swept through the village. The stench of lesser fiends and demons carried the odor of rotten meat and the coming of something worse. Seca peered into the village with Osiax's eyes. She spotted an old goat herd leading five goats with a long stick. The man stopped short and staggered for a moment on unsteady legs. He then dropped to the ground and vomited whatever sparse contents remained from the day's meal. His goats bleated fearfully and scattered. Seca's mouth watered with eagerness for the events to come. If only she could be there for the slaughter... She longed for something wild to chase. She loved the intoxication she felt when her victims realized they were doomed, and the primal fear on the faces that followed. Osiax worked his demons into a wild frenzy with the promise of human flesh to rend and devour. Lesser fiends scurried between the legs of hulking abominations or jumped up and down on their backs. The larger beasts barked and snapped their jaws at the bothersome pests. The guttural language of the horde echoed through the trees. A wayward traveler would think the creatures of the forest had suddenly gone mad. Just as the dire symphony of the horde reached its crescendo, it ceased with a word from its master. Osiax was always one for theatrics. No birds chirped or insects buzzed. Even the air between the trees went still, holding its breath in anticipation. Osiax had become proficient at raiding the human villages, and the horde followed his orders with precision. If a lesser demon or fiend disobeyed his will, it was destroyed without question. Any challenges to his authority were met with battle, as was the way of demonkind. None were a match for Osiax and his brutal blade. The loser's essence was obliterated, and never again able to reform in the rejuvenation pits of Gothos. Such was his promise to the horde. Osiax barked out another command, and the horde raced forward. The forest trees provided a weak defense against the rampaging monsters. Ancient oaks cried, cracked, and fell to the ground with loud swooshes. Smaller maple trees exploded under the weight of the massive oaks in a hail of splinters and red leaves. The branches of thick chestnut trees shook and then shattered, tossing their serrated leaves into the air. The forest canopy resembled a thousand colorful birds dashing and darting into flight. Prickly ground bushes were uprooted, thrown into the air, and stampeded under hoof and claw. 
unnatural combinations of man, beast, and otherworldly filth spawned from the ice plains of Gothels, raced out of the forest and into their defenseless village. The living nightmares unleashed horrific mayhem to those within their diabolic reach. The villagers were overwhelmed with little effort from the horde. Those not killed by the initial onslaught of bloodlust were herded to the center square by deformed, bear-like demons covered in thorny barbs. The demons held double and thrice-pronged spears, which they used to poke and prod the prisoners into makeshift holding pens. Other demons with flat faces and bird-like beaks roamed through the holding pens. They placed iron shackles around the necks of the terrified townsfolk. The restraints were attached to long chains, which traveled back into the forest mist, where they were held in the massive grip of a pink-skinned giant that rivaled the height of the younger trees. Seca knew this Gothos giant well, for he was the only one of her lesser juggernauts whom she had summoned. Malgris would have no more until he brought her the ever-hero. The giant beast was called Morteg, the despoiler in the mortal tongue. His upper torso was that of a man but he possessed a boar-shaped head with enormous tusks that jutted from his oversized mouth. His lips were slathered in mucus, and ropes of drool dripped down his face to resemble a liquid beard. More textured on four sturdy legs, and his long tail was covered in glistening iridescent scales. It swished through the dead leaves and wrapped around the trunk of a tree. Lord Osiak spoke to Seca in his thoughts. Shall we see what we have caught this day, my queen? Even in his mortal form, Lord Osex towered over the villagers. He regarded them knowingly, as a victorious warlord eyed a defeated rival's followers. They would be fodder for darker deeds to come. He stared at the townsfolk with a gleam in his pale purple eyes, satisfied with himself as he took in the plentiful catch. The villagers huddled in a mass of trembling flesh, holding one another in fear. Are you pleased? Carry on, Lord Osiax. Withered and desiccated beings, the color of bleached bone, jumped into the pens. Their arms and legs were long and spindly. They wove through the terrified villagers, leaving a trail of frosty footprints in the dirt. The demons weeded through the families and grabbed the children from their horrified parents. The young ones were tossed together in a smaller group to the side, and guarded by other misshapen demons resembling bulbous toads. Lidless eyes protruded from the spotted gray bodies and rolled to see everything at once. The children screamed in panic as they stared into the slavering jaws and rounded lips of the hungry beasts. They pleaded for the mother's embrace. Some ran but were devoured by the toad demons in a single gulp. There's an elusive one. Seca telepathically sent to Osiax. They both saw a lone villager slip between cottages. The man raced to a small group of villagers that had been previously undetected by the horde. He wore a short, off-white robe of a healer, with a cobalt-blue monk's sash tied around his waist. He quickly reached a family huddled together on the porch of a small cabin. Apparently, we have found a true believer, Seca sent to Lord Osiax. The monk will not survive, Lord Osiax replied. Check him first, Lord Osiax, then you may have your fun. Fear not, my children, the power of eight and us shall prevail. The old monk called out so that all could hear. We shall banish these dreadful hosts through his blessing. Lord Osiax motioned to a beast handler and pointed to the monk. The handler unleashed a pack of six quadruped fiends covered in coarse yellowish quills. The fiends howled in delight as they raced after new prey. The monk saw the pack and swished his arms together in a broad rhythmic pattern. The upswept leaves on the porch swirled at his sandaled feet and bounced off his brown leggings. The air shimmered around the family and encased them in a transparent sphere of bluish hue. Three of the smaller fiendish dogs broke away from the pack and sprinted toward the isolated villagers. Their long jaws snapped together and strands of slobber trailed like ribbons from their gums. Mad hunger drove them senseless, and one after the other they leaped into the air. The air sparked to life as each fiend struck the barrier protecting the villagers. The sphere flashed with bright blue light, and the fiendish dogs dissolved into black ash. The remaining pack skidded to a stop. 
for all abyssal creatures know the toxic smell of divine energy. It was anathema to their flesh and held certain doom for lesser demons. The fiendish dogs backed away in frustration, thwarted from reaching their price. The monk held his ground and concentrated on maintaining the barrier. The fiendish dogs scampered along the edge of the ages. One snapped at another, and the two fought until only one was left alive. The victor gnashed its teeth at its remaining brother. Osiax looked at the blood and carnage splashed throughout the village. Sick, I could see the satisfaction in his heart. He walked to the barrier as the lesser demons and fiends parted before him in deference. The power of eight of us shall smite you as it did your cursed minions. The demon warlord chuckled. <laughs> There is strength in your spirit, and possibly more in your soul. But how long do you think you can last, old man? Osiax said. Osiax gingerly tapped the barrier twice and quickly removed his hand. He blew on his burnt finger and contemplated the wall of light preventing his fiends from their savory morsels. Such a distant song Aetanus now sings, if any at all, Osiax said absentmindedly. He inhaled a deep draft of air and placed his entire outstretched palm on the barrier. He lowered his head and murmured throaty words with complex syllables as he exhaled. The runes on his garments came to life. The barrier protecting the villagers faded. Osiax raised his pale blue eyes at the monk. What now, old man? Thou shalt burn in the holy fire of righteousness, the monk said. He jumped off the porch and into action. He conjured a pillar of fire that engulfed Osiax. The fiendish dogs, scurrying at the warlord's feet, burst into flames and then were incinerated to ash. The rest of the horde moved aside as they saw what the holy fire could do. The column of flame rose into the air and bathed the small village in divine light. The old monk dropped to his knees, exhausted from the release of so much fires into energy. The power of Aetna saves us, one of the villagers proclaimed. The Heavenly Mother and her Son of Light have protected us, another said. Father Dante is a monk of the Four Orders, a third villager said. He never said a word. A cheer of sorts came about from the villagers in the holding pen. Most were still in shock and awe of what they had witnessed. They stared wide-eyed at the column of flame. Then Lord Osiak stepped unharmed through the conflagration. Not today, I'm afraid, Lord Osiak said. He brushed at the smoldering furs to tap away any adolescent flame that threatened to rekindle. Anything else? The old man's energy was spent. He looked up at the smoking figure of Osiak. Seca saw defiance in the man's eyes. You will need to be broken, Lord Osiak. But see the youngling entering the square. Osiax saw a child walking toward the chaos instead of fleeing from it. The little girl rubbed her eyes and called for her mother between sobs. One of the prisoners in the holding pen saw her too. He pushed past a demon bear thing and sprang over the wall of overturned carts to rescue the young child. The sleepy eyes recognized him immediately, then grew wide as a pack of lithe demons with curved beaks leapt on his back and ripped him to shreds. Blood and viscera burst in the air as the villagers struggled in vain against the demons. The child went down with less of a fight. Well, that was unfortunate, Osiak said, but not unexpected. His voice was a rich baritone, and each word echoed in his throat with an animalistic growl. He paused to think of what a human noble might say in this situation. I am dreadfully sorry for this bit of inconvenience, but your dear neighbor to the north, Maugris the Infinite, demands the pleasure of your company. The sound of malice in his voice mocked the pleasantries of his words. Osiax could not keep the grin from his mouth. He savored the pungent smell of fear now reeking from the peasants. I am the great demon Lord Osiax, High General of Her Majesty Seca's Frost Legions, and Baron of the Frozen Wasteland of Thresh. I am at your service, he bowed deeply. What do you want with us? Father Dante said. I mean to escort you safely through the high peaks of the Hoarfrost Mountains and beyond to Racklish Fortress. There you will work to till the frozen soil and harvest the food for the Army of the North. Margaret the Mad, 
You send our souls to oblivion. In the name of Aetanos, the light bringer and the smiter of darkness, I command you be gone, Father Dante said. He did his best to stand. His commanding voice helped to stabilize the growing fear and moans of the villagers. I shall smite you, demon, as Aetanos once did long ago. We shall not be fuel for dark sorceries, he said. Father Dante glared at the creatures surrounding him. The howls and screeches of the abominations grew louder. They should be a grand batch for the ice pyre. Such fear. However, the child was not enough. The defiant one brings them hope. Take the monk, Sekka commanded. Ossiax motioned to two tall demons with bloated midsections. Pus wept from their eyes. He then pointed at the old man. Bring him. The tall demons grabbed Father Dante with their long limbs. Rough, white hands secured the old man and dragged him to their master. They dropped the monk in a frosted puddle of mud at Ossiax's feet. The frozen dirt cracked and bit sharply into the monk's hands and knees. Why, oh, why must you mortals always make this more difficult than it need to be? Aetanoth is no longer with you. He rots in the deepest hole in the mistress's keep. Nearby demons laughed and nodded their cursed heads in agreement. Father Dante glared up from the puddle of reddish muck and raised himself to his knees. Be gone, in the name of the light bringer and the return of his ever hero, foul creature, be gone. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. You speak of the avatar of Aetanos, yes? Could he be you, old man? Ossiax took a small amulet from a pouch at his belt and held it over the monk's head. An emerald sparkled and twirled at its end, but that was all. He is useless, Sekka voice in Ossiax's mind. Sadly, you are not the one. Well then, would you know where I might find this human hero with the soul of a demigod? Hmm? He shall be with us when our need is greatest. I would think that time is now, don't you? Go back to the deep dark, Father Dante said. He slumped defeated in the cold mud. He shall come. Ossiax looked around the ruined village and waited a moment. He even held his hand to his ear as if listening. It appears he will not come this day, more's the pity, for if you are not the ever hero, no able to provide the information concerning his whereabouts, then you are of little use to me. A wolfish smile broadened on Ossiax's face. He unsheathed his terrible blade and held it even with Father Dante's eyes. An icy chill filled the air as frost fell from the vile weapon, and the nervous sweat dripping from the monk's forehead froze in place. This is ice horror, and she is a most frigid wench. Ossiac swung the sword in a low arc and sliced clear through Father Dante's neck. The cut was so quick and precise that there was no blood. The old man's body turned blue and crystallized instantly. Ossiac's deftly kicked the decapitated head into the air. A winged creature grabbed it in mid-flight. The airborne demon glided to a nearby rooftop and consumed its price. A hush came over the villagers as they stared in disbelief as the body of Father Dante collapsed in the mud. A nice touch, Sekka thought. She was enjoying the show. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, travel arrangements, Ossiak said. He turned to the villagers in the holding pen. Please, take us and leave the children behind. What could Malgris need with small children? They are but infants, lamented one young mother. Her tears ran through the grime of her face. Her dirty hands came together in prayer above her head. They will not survive the harsh passage north, sobbed another. She bowed and cowered in the mud of the pen. Ossiak tapped his finger to his lips three times. Indeed, the journey north would be a bit extreme for the youngsters. You make a fair request, and to show you I am a just host, I decree the children shall remain, Ossiak said. He dramatically swept his arms through the air in a grandiose manner. Your prayers have been answered. A glimmer of encouragement came to the faces of many of the villagers. <laughs> Although their doom was sealed, at least the children would be saved. Besides, they have a more immediate use, Ossiak said as he turned to the demonic horde behind him. Enjoy. The villagers' eyes grew wide in disbelief. They watched in horror as the wretched demons 
pounced on their helpless children. A bloody mist floated like a crimson cloud through the square. The monsters left nothing but slashed and tattered clothing and red-stained dirt once they had their fill. Osiak signaled Mortek the despoiler to begin. The chains drew taut. The villagers were pulled to their feet and forced to march to their doom. The old and grief-stricken who could no longer walk were dragged. A gangly and sinewy demon approached Osiax as the horde left the pillaged village. His face bore the scarring indicative of advanced rank. Till the soil, Lord, there is no soil in the north. It is frozen rock as far as the eye can see. The ground is barren. I thought it best to have something to entertain us along the way. We shall flay them one by one and mount them on posts marking our progress north. If the ever-hero has risen, they should create a trail of carnage easy enough for that miserable soul to follow. And what of the quota set by Malchris? The sorcerer's demands were clear. The petty magician shall have his share of soul slaves to be sacrificed in the name of the mistress. We will have plenty to spare from the next village. <laughs> Both demons laughed and followed the horde into the cold mist of the dark forest. Can you taste the sweetness of their dashed hopes, my queen? You have done well, Lord Arsiax. You have entertained me well and lifted my mood. Your rewards shall be great upon delivery of the Ever Hero. I have something special planned for you once my prize is in my grasp. Thank you, my queen. I shall have reward enough when Isoro takes the head of that miserable wrench, Maugris. Seka severed the connection to Arsiax. Vision returned to the stone walls of the scrying chamber. She smoothed the thin layer of icy film on the water's surface and traced new designs in the slush. It was time to see what progress her nemesis Zisfander had made, if any, toward reaching the ice world of Gothos. Seka reached out to the minds of her border scouts. Only one remained. Fresh frost formed on the walls as Seca cast her spell and established a connection to her minion, who answered her summons with dire news. What story of the borders? Where are the other scouts? The Red Devil has taken his first steps into Gothos. The outer limits of Falshore are ablaze. The others did not survive says Vander's fury. Seca looked upon the desolation through her servant's eyes. Great rivers of magma flowed where thick eyes had once laid dormant for thousands of years. The land boiled and bubbled like a sea of fire. Geysers of red magma erupted into the air, then fell back into the lava flow. Scalding hot steam whistled out the pending death song of her land. Sisfander had reached the outer borders of her realm and was circumventing the plain, creating a wall of fire around its edge. Seca took it all in, with a calm reserve. He is taunting me. He means to lure me out into the open and engage him in direct battle. Time was growing short. She pondered his location for a moment. Why was she not notified about his exact movements? How had he reached Gotha so quickly and without her knowledge? She should have been warned. This was precisely the type of information lesser devils used to win favor, or at least her attention. There should have been more buffers to slow him down. Smaller skirmishes with allied devils as he passed through their realms. But there was nothing. Betrayal within her dominion came to mind. But if Zisfander knew her present location, he would have already pounced on Furia Keep. There was a grander scheme being played. But by whom? Lord Osiax, you must be quick. Time works against Garthos. She spoke aloud, lost in her musings, when Maugris interrupted her thoughts. Are you talking to my errand boy, Osiax? Has he the slaves I demanded? Leave me, Seca said. But she had no control over the sorcerer. Where is my army? And not this piecemeal rabble, you insist, is all you can bring me? I demand the great beasts of Garthos to lay waste on Barokia. Where are the famed behemoths? Maugris' impatience had reached its limits. Seca's hand deftly brushed through the slushy water and any remnants of the conversation with her scout. You failed to bring me the raw material needed to fulfill your request, Seca said with ease. A chaos gate must be opened, and to do this, you must give me the soul of the ever-hero. 
Only in this manner can I bring forth the greater beasts. There is no ever hero to be found, Malchus screamed. I have indulged your foolish whims long enough. My resources are taxed. The spies have found nothing. The ever hero is a myth. I have enough of your excuses. I shall have my revenge on those who saw fit to banish me to this frozen desolation. He waved his arms and hands frantically as if to encompass the entire realm of the north. You are trained. It is clear from your complexion and disposition. The unconscious strain of fighting back Seca's constant mental probing was exacting a high toll on the sorcerer. His skin was pale and drawn tight across the bones of his face. His bloodshot eyes were sat back in dark hollows. Seca reached out her hand to soothe Maugris's gaunt cheek. His face twitched as if her touch burnt his skin. His eyes flashed with madness. Do not insult me with your false compassion. Seca withdrew her hand. The hint of a smile peeked at the corners of her mouth. Not long now, she thought. The relentless riptide of magical current she sent into Maugris's mind was wearing him down. Her mental barrage was slowly eroding his willpower and resolve. The power struggle between the two foes was formidable. Maugris was forced to draw deeply from the well of eldritch energy to increase his magical resistance to her probe. However, pure magic was not inherent in humans, and it claimed too much of their life force as payment. Maugris's fate will be no different. What have you been up to? Seca said, her words stripped with a mother's suspicion toward a naughty child. Could he be secretly communing with Zisvander? My actions and whereabouts are my own, Margaret said defiantly. He wore the guilty countenance of a conspirator. Do not forget who is master, devil. I only ask in that I may assist you in summoning more dim kind. Your new wizard cabal does not possess enough strength to bring forth anything of merit from the abyss. If you want to summon another who is equal to Mortek, then you will be forced to devour the life force of all your remaining wizards. What will you do when you have no more wizards? The greater juggernauts of Gothos demand a high tax, and you will have nothing of value to sacrifice. The powerful behemoths such as Simrius will ignore you. She watched him calculate possibilities, frowning as he realized she was right. The juggernauts will do. I must have all of them, and I want them now. He smashed his fist into an open palm. No more tricks. Do as I command, devil, or you will know my wrath. You cannot command me to do something that is not within my power to provide. I will tell you again. Only a chaos gate has the means to bypass the amaranthine barrier and transport the true power of Gothos into the mortal realm. This is the only way you will achieve your goal. Her mind raced through possible scenarios. Combined energy of soul slaves from any of the great cities found in the Three Kingdoms would be more than enough to topple Zizfander. The remaining cities would provide her with a surplus of infernal currency. She would have power enough to bargain her way into the highest echelons of power in the Abyss. Perhaps even a position among the Great Three. Her imagination traveled beyond the Three Kingdoms of Hannah and into the broader world of mortals. If she could open a chaos gate, the potential for soul energy would be limitless. Nay, she would not demand a mere position among the great three. She would topple them. As her lust for power grew, so did her excitement to inflict pain. She was tempted to rip the heart on Margaret's chest and feast upon it before his very eyes. Her arm was held in check by the power of the binding spell. She returned to matters at hand. The invasion of Hannah must be quick. All would be lost if Zizvander attacked while her physical presence was still trapped in the mortal realm. She must have the soul of the ever hero. She must. Maugris marched over to the scrying bowl and looked to the frosted water. The slush had settled, and nothing remained of the previous spell Sek had cast. Do not pander with me. I grow weary of your excuses. Summon my army, or I will replace you in the most humiliating way, and you will never see Furia Keep or your precious Gothos again. 
Malgris stormed out of the chamber. The time is short, magician, truly short, Seka said through clenched teeth. Fifteen. Kasai. Master, why are we not being followed? Kasai said. He took most of Master Shogar's weight on his shoulder. I suspect the enemy is busy checking the bodies of our dead. They are looking for something or someone, Master Sugar replied. He spoke with more of a wheeze than a voice. Now is our best opportunity to reach the lower levels. Let me grab a travel pack first. We'll need supplies. Kasai returned promptly, and the two monks fled through the smoky passages that led to the catacombs. They blended with the shadows like thieves in the night. There was no alarm that their passing had been discovered. Lucky, 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 Kasai whispered. Eventually, Kasai heard the whistle of night air rustling through the catacombs like lonely ghosts. They hobbled into the moldy subterranean chambers and disturbed a nest of mice. The small shadows scampered in a hundred directions underfoot. Kasai held his breath as the squeals of the red-eyed rodents echoed off the walls of the old passages. They turned a corner, and the silhouette of the outer gate was in sight, their last door to freedom. Upon opening, the small iron portcullis practically catawalled from disuse. Kasai's heart beat faster. He gave the gate a quick shove to end its rebellious wail. He cautiously stepped out and did a quick survey of the area. The harvest moon was high in the night sky and bathed the entire ground in soft blue light. Their way was clearly illuminated and left them naked to anyone who happened to look in their direction. Kasai felt just like one of the frightened mice that had scurried for a proper hiding place. His senses were alert for signs of danger as they raced down a rarely trodden footpath and into a copse of trees. Like fugitives, they scampered low to the ground, wary of being spotted by hostile eyes. Surprisingly, Master Shogar took the lead, albeit stumbling as he went, and somehow managed to flawlessly navigate his way along the trail with unseeing eyes and unsteady legs. Soon they came to their first bridge. Master, the bells. Those who attack the monastery will not know the song of the bells. They will assume it is nothing but the wind, Master Sugar said. Kasai looked up to the monastery walls and then across the open gap. This was a very long bridge. He looked far below where the cliff wall vanished from sight. If anyone happened to look our way while we crossed, the boundless will hide our passage, Master Sugar said, then muffled a cough as best he could. Just the same, we should traverse the underside, Kazai said. He looked closely at Master Sugar. He looked bad. The poison continued to leech away the master's strength. The old monk coughed again. This time it was buried in the sleeve of his robe. Kasai took some rope from the small travel pack he had appropriated from the monastery supply chamber. Luckily, the storeroom was en route to the lower vaults that led to the catacombs. Master Sugar, I ask with great respect, will you allow me to assist you across the bridge? Master Sugar nodded once in agreement and offered no resistance. Kasai strapped his master on his back and secured the ropes around his own chest. Kasai knelt carefully to the lower side of the bridge and grabbed a handful of weathered ropes. So this is why Master Dore made us climb with rocks in our packs, Kasai said, hoping to add a little levity and calm his own frayed nerves. They moved together like two awkward spiders buffeted by the wind. Fear of losing his grip threatened to break his concentration. Kasai grunted with each reach and grab. Somehow he remained focused. Safety drew closer with each lunge and successful grab. Midway across the span, Kasai came to a halt. I need to rest, Kasai said. Are you okay, master? Kasai hooked his legs between connecting pieces of rope and let his arms rest one at a time. Master Sugar's arms and legs were wrapped around Kasai's torso like a jungle sloth. I will be fine. Do not worry for me, Master Sugar said. You have much of your father's strength. A bright spirit to move the body forward. With all respect, master, I take after my mother. My father was a liar and a coward, a disgrace to those who looked upon him as their protector. Those are harsh words coming from the son of Jare Shu. I knew of a different man, one that gave of himself more than he thought of his own needs. Did you know your father was a great healer? 
he was able to blend his Zindu energies together and use the unique energy to mend broken bones and cure the infirmed. It is a rare gift, though I suspect with the right training you will be able to do the same. Training? What good was training when the entire monastery had been overrun so quickly? Kasai thought. Master, please do not refer to my father as if he were a saint. He abandoned us, my mother and me, when we needed him most. He ran away to save himself from those creatures, instead of protecting us. Yes, Master Kunshin has told me the unfortunate story of how you came to us at Urdu. He was sorry he could not save your mother when he found you both, lost in the wilderness as you were. Her wounds were too great for even his skill. I know, Kasai said. He remained silent and thoughtful. Let us be on our way, Brother Kasai. The assassin may return with greater numbers when they discover our absence. They may already have our scent. I don't suppose you have any safety nets below us here, do you? Not this time, my son. If we fall, we will fall for an awfully long time. Trust in the boundless to guide your hands. Luckily, the autumn winds held their breath, and the air remained still. Kasai and Master Shoga reached the far side and climbed back to solid ground undetected. A few steps later, they were under cover of trees. Kasai untied Master Shogar and lowered him to the ground. He placed a small travel pack behind the old monk's head. Rest, Master. Kasai's shoulders and forearms burned from fatigue. He looked back to the monastery walls and saw tiny torchlights bobbing across the many bridges and moving along the edges of the cliffs. The monastery had been overrun and they needed to keep moving. Kasai knew they had been lucky so far, but doubted it would last. They shouldn't be able to see us from here, Kasai said. He rubbed his arms to increase circulation. Who would do such a thing to peaceful monks? The forest was alive with activity. Kasai noticed gashes in the trunks of nearby trees and traced his fingers along the grooves. What's this? Kasai said, then looked nervously into the wooded shadows. Vargru, Master Shogar said. He sat quietly. His head was tilted to the sky. Master Shogar, the Vargru marked their territory. This pack has given us fair warning. We are outside the protective boundaries of Ordo. We now trespass on their domain. Kasai had been wary of enemy pursuit all night and worried that the poison from the assassin's dart would continue to hinder his master's movement. He had hoped the shadows from the forest canopy would provide enough cover to conceal their location while he figured out what to do next. And now this? The Vargru would not need sight to guide them. Master, we should move on. The enemy has made progress down the eastern slope. They will find the lower bridges soon. Master Shogar rose slowly and nodded in agreement. Kasai inspected the festering wound and realized the master would need medical attention very soon. Kasai spotted a patch of peppermint and removed a handful of the bumpy, spade-shaped leaves from the plants. He offered a few of the bitter yet flavorful leaves to Master Shogar. He took a few for himself. Come, Master, let us put some distance between us and our pursuers. They moved at Master Shogar's pace, through the trees and half-submerged boulders. Kasai offered his support whenever Master Shogar grunted in discomfort. Kasai suggested short rests whenever possible, although he felt the enemy's presence behind every shadow or unfamiliar noise. Their garments were ill-equipped to handle autumn's cold night air. Kasai chastised himself for not thinking to grab two heavier robes or a travel shelter to keep them warm and dry while they slept. As if on cue, the wind changed direction and blew cold air down from the mountains. It would only get colder along their journey to the Temple of Illumination in Gethem. There was nothing for it now. He decided to risk a small fire to give them a bit of warmth. Kasai grabbed the travel pack and rummaged through its contents. The bag contained items meant for a few days' excursion away from the monastery, nothing more. There was a small clay bowl for eating and drinking, a small pot for boiling water, some whey bread and dry jerky, a canteen, some flint and tinder, a fishing line with a lure and a compass. He sighed. It would have to be enough. He found a large slanted rock jutting out from the ground. It would provide enough cover to shield the firelight from distant pursuers. We are in luck, Master Shogar said with a half smile. He pulled his knees to his chest and wrapped his arms closer around his legs, waiting for the fire to warm his body. The night wind blows our scent downwind, away from pursuit. Kasai scanned the direction they were headed. 
But what if something worse waits for us along this path? Upward, through the loose canopy of swaying trees, he saw a thousand shining stars in the dark sky. At least it wasn't raining, he chuckled to himself. Just rest a bit, Master Shogar. I'll make some tea. Kasai gathered leafy herbs not far from where they camped. He was fortunate to also find wild ginger and wolfberry growing nearby. They put the roots and berries into a small pouch and returned to their makeshift camp. Kasai placed the ingredients into the small bowl, then ground them into fine meal with a rock. Next came boiling water from the pot he had placed next to the fire. The elixir wouldn't cure Master Shogar, but it might ease his discomfort. Master, drink this. It will lessen the inflammation of your wound, Kasai said. He could smell the wound in Master Shogar's back. That was worrisome. Kasai shook his head in disbelief, as if things couldn't get any worse. Now he had to contend with Vargru. He knew something of the creature's lore from his studies. The sorcerer, Malgris, or his witches or warlocks, had mutated the animals of the forest and turned them into horrors to help lay waste to the frontier villages. The Vargru were abominations driven to madness, and they hunted in packs. Kasai was roused from his musings by a distant screech. He looked at Master Shogar to see if he heard it too. Master Shogar sat quietly enjoying his tea. Kasai strained to listen for another, but there was none. They won't bother us, Kasai said, mostly to calm his nerves. He heard strange and exotic sounds, some deep and guttural, some high-pitched clicking and clucking. The forest was saturated with noise. He tried to distinguish which, if any of the sounds, were threatening. His imagination played cruel tricks on his hearing. Nerves. It was just his nerves getting the better of him. He took a deep breath. Then he heard the screech again, and then another, like the first but closer. Master Shogar handed the clay bowl back to Kasai and leaned against a small boulder to rest. I've always enjoyed this time of year the most. Such wonderful colors all around. Kasai looked at Master Shogar with incredulous wonder. Colors? Master, we cannot rest now. I fear we're being hunted by more than just the attackers of the monastery. Kasai began breaking down the small camp and gathering up their meager supplies. Yes, Brother Kasai, I too have heard the song of the Vargru. They shall be along soon enough. But first, sit a moment more with me. Let us speak together of the Boundless. Now, Master... There is always time for now, Brother Kasai. There is more you must learn before the end. Master Shogar paused for a moment. Your mind is strong, but already too full of answers for one so young. This is what keeps you separated from understanding the Boundless, perhaps even more so now. I am open to the Boundless, Master. I just wish I could see it. The Boundless is formless, yet you see it everywhere with your open eyes and your listening ears. You feel it in the temperature in the air, the, and the wetness of water, or the thickness of the earth. All these things are alive, and they speak through a universal language of vibrations. You need only learn to decipher their message, as you did atop the pillars. When you do this, you will see, feel, and hear a different world. Silence your mind and the melodies change. I understand, Master. Do you? I wonder. I sense little harmony with the alignment of your Zindu energies. Forgive me, Master. I'm more comfortable trusting the strength in my body rather than something intangible or magical, Kasai said. He hoped that would end the conversation. Magical? Now you sound like Brother Daku. You both mistrust what you cannot control. The known is no more your friend than the unknown. Daku, how could he do those things? Kasai shuddered. Brother Daku's journey was set in motion long before that dreadful event. But Master, the way of Urdu should have prevented him from... From what? Do you think the way of Urdu has the power to sway a soul from its predestined journey? Yes. If not, then what good are the lessons and the training? Kasai looked at his master in bewilderment. He sat back against the side of another boulder and rubbed his temples. None of this makes any sense. Kasai's vision blurred, and he suddenly felt very weak. Disturbing images overloaded his mind. Daku was Kasai's spiritual brother and his friend. 
He was a difficult person to deal with, but that was because most people didn't understand his code of friendship. You were either with the coup or against him. There was no middle ground. He demanded unconditional loyalty and respect. But to murder his brothers? What could have possessed him to that extreme? He saw his dead brothers in his mind, and then the assassin, and the alluring demon. He quickly shut her from his thoughts. His thoughts became a confused jumble of images without meaning. The world he knew had been turned inside out. Master Shogar was speaking. The tone of his words was soothing. Kasaya became calm. We all have a seed within us that matures to fruition over our days. During the time we are given, the sapling matures and grows into the highest and strongest tree possible. The amount of water, sun, and care that is given to the seed will not change the type of tree that grows. Perhaps it will stunt or accelerate the growth, but it cannot change the nature of the tree. I understand, Master, because I lied. He didn't understand. Seeds and trees did not help him comprehend how Daku could have strayed so far from the path of the light. There was a whirlwind of conflicting thoughts and emotions crashing against the walls of his sense of reason. Come, Master, let us be on our way. Kasai did his best to push thoughts of Daku the killer out of his mind. He had more pressing concerns to solve. Kasai needed to get Master Shoga to a healer that could counteract the poison in his blood. The city of Gethem seemed to be an eternity away. The weary monks pushed on for a few more hours before stopping for the night. The deep forest never slept. Kasai could understand why. It was the noisiest place he had ever experienced. Night birds chirped and hooted, and an occasional wolf howled into the dark sky. The clicking sound of insects was relentless. Kasai felt as if they crawled mercilessly over his body. The horrible screeches persisted. Their wails sounded like mocking laughter. Kasai's body ached. The grueling flight from the monastery had not been kind to his sore muscles. Kasai searched for sleep that his mind could not find. He drifted in and out of a nightmarish haze. The events of the last twelve hours replayed over and over in his head. He saw the image of Master Kunshin flicker in and out of focus. He saw smoke and darts sailing toward him in slow motion. Ninzizida reacted in a blur of movement as the three sections that made up the staff flashed out to shatter or block each projectile. Kasai saw in sharp magnification the one dart he had inadvertently deflected into his master. He could see the poison tip in sharp detail as it ripped through loose ropes and impaled itself into his master's flesh. He felt the suffocating weight of massive rocks heavy on his chest. The shifting image of Master Kunshin finally settled to the face of the assassin. It changed again to a mask resembling the face of Daku. His friend leered down at him while he was trapped under the rocks. I told you, but you wouldn't listen, Daku said. Now look at me. A rough hand took away the mask to reveal something else, something unnatural. Pink eyes filled with malice and hate stared back at him. Then the thing faded from sight. Sixteen. Desdemonia. Desdemonia sat at the stoop of her small cottage. It wasn't much, but it was home of a sort. The morning sun hadn't yet chased away the chill in the air. The skin on her exposed arms was like goose flesh, but she didn't mind. She appreciated the sensation. She stretched out her legs and drew arcs in the dirt with her heels. Blackbirds and robins chirped in the nearby trees. The leaves were well through the color shift, and every day more fell to the ground. She blew a rogue strand of hair from her face. She watched it fall back into the same place, then tucked it behind her ear. Another day in paradise, she sighed. She was lonely. It was always worse this time of year, when autumn brought memories of brighter days learning her craft from her parents and playing hide-and-seek with a village idiot. He wasn't really an idiot. He just didn't have any magic in him. Not one bit. It was a rare condition among the sunnies. 
But she didn't care. She liked him for who he was, not what he could do. She could have found another village to take her in as a stray, but that would mean staying in Sunnim and more bad memories. She needed to move on and find a new life, somewhere away from the jungle. She would go someplace where there wouldn't be so many reminders of what she lost. But the fragrant blooms from the late autumn flowers wouldn't let her forget. They came on the wind from the south and through the Sarabi Pass into Parochia. The jungle found her and wouldn't let her go. Estimonia couldn't escape her past. She glanced to her right and saw three chickens pecking at stones at her feet. She rolled her eyes. Rocks are rocks, you dumb birds. She cast a simple spell and seeds tumbled to the ground. The chickens clucked happily and enjoyed their breakfast. Now a little something for me. She walked to the fruit trees growing in the clearing that made up her yard. She climbed the fig tree first and gathered a handful of small fruit. Maybe an apple as well. She hummed a tune as she gathered her breakfast. She heard a telltale screech in the distance. It was far enough away not to be a problem. The Vargru were only dangerous when they hunted in numbers. Maybe this one was just lonely too. She heard a rustle in the brush beyond the tree line. Something was out there, something big. She put her hands on her hips. Not now. I don't want to play. I'm hungry. The rustling stopped. A heavy grumble came from the bush. If you're going to sulk, then I'm going inside. She waited a minute. Fine. But you're staying outside this time. Desdemonia walked back to the cottage to enjoy her figs. She forgot about the apple. Her little home was cozy, and she liked it that way. There was no room in here for that big oaf anyway, she said. She washed the figs in a bucket of water, cut them in half, and drizzled just a bit of honey over them. She sat on a small bench under a small table. Her fingers knocked the figs back and forth. What do you think, Aldi? Maybe we should move again? She spoke loud enough so her voice projected outside. I don't know. Where would we go? A city? Ha, <laughs> never. She popped a fig half into her mouth. What is that tree bark for brains up to now? Galdemore, what are you doing? She went outside and noticed immediately that the birds had stopped chirping. She heard a second screech and a third. The Vagru were on the hunt. When will they learn? She said. Come on, Galdi. It seems the old Alpha wants to test my boundaries again. Testimonia ran into the forest. The trees across the clearing swayed aside as something large followed in her direction. Then whatever it was pushing through the trees vanished, as if swallowed by the earth. 17. Kasai Kasai awoke from a restless sleep, covered in morning dew. He was shivering and his body was sore and ached with fatigue. Kasai wrapped his arms around his body to keep from shaking. He lied to himself, saying it was from the chill in the morning air, not the dream. He looked over at Master Shoker and saw his skin was alabaster blue. Poison should not affect a master monk in such a manner. I should have kept the fire going, Kasai scolded himself as he quickly gathered some loose twigs and leaves for kindling. Master, does your injury still bother you? I shall eat more tea. It will soothe your pain and help you regain your strength. Thank you, my son, Shoker said. His voice was soft and distant. We must continue to the Temple of Illumination in Gethem. I must speak with Grandmaster Nusulu. Something terrible is upon us. Something bigger than the destruction of Ordu. Yes, Master. We will be on our way after some breakfast. Please forgive me for saying so, but your skin lacks the warmth of your heart. Something is not right. Fear not for me, Master Shoker said. He propped himself up to a sitting position. I shall persevere. The old man grinned briefly as some of his old humor returned. A breeze blew through the tree canopy above them. The thick branches swayed back and forth, releasing brilliant red, yellow, and orange leaves. The sunlight intensified their color as they spiraled down to the ground. They looked like midsummer lanterns, Kasai said. As with all things, their beauty shines true in the light, Master Shoker said. He wiped a trickle of blood from the edge of his mouth. All things, master? 
You cannot also mean to include the evil that attacked the monastery, or what Daku did. All things have their natural place in the great balance. When something is pure to itself and follow its natural way, you will see its truth. When you understand the truth of a thing, you can then appreciate its beauty. All too often we are seduced by the great manipulator, or evil, as you call it. Our emotions turn against us. Our bodies no longer listen to our will. Our minds play tricks on us, and soon we have become pawns to a darker power. We give in to the ease of its disordered desires. Thus, we surrender our light and become an instrument of darkness. I don't understand, Master. How can evil control the pure at heart? Be mindful of the kinks in your armor, Brother Kasai, for we all have many. Evil searches for weaknesses to exploit, and does so in subtle ways. We are most vulnerable when we are unaware of the manipulation. Beware the double-ganger disguised as truth. How will I be able to see evil for what it truly is, Master? You saw the truth of the assassin beneath his glamour. That was a fine feat. Sadly, Master Dorje and Master Kunshin could not see the truth before it was too late. Nor did I sense the changeling's presence. Changeling, Kasai became silent. He could not comprehend what that word meant. All of this seemed unreal. However, the scattered memories of his earliest childhood told him a different story. The monsters were real. He looked hesitantly at Master Sugar. I don't know how that happened. I was scared at first and wanted to flee. But then I remember the younglings. I knew they would need help during the battle, so I went back. When I reached the inner sanctum, I saw the fires and broken bodies. I was closest to Master Doris' chamber and sought his guidance. His light had been extinguished when I found him. I am sorry I did not say so earlier, Master. I understand. I assumed as much from the assassin's bold words. Please continue. I saw death in every hall and room. I ran to find Master Kunshin. I saw him dead, as you now know. I knew you would be next if you were not already dead, so I ran to find you. I realized I was weaponless as I ran past the Hall of Artifacts. I ran back to look for anything that would help, but all the weapons were locked in their cabinets. I noticed the ceiling had fallen over one case. My eyes watered from so much smoke and I could not see clearly. Though I did not know it at the time, my hand grabbed Nince's Zeta. I tucked the collapsed staff into my sash and ran out of the room. Did you now? Master Shogar said with surprising interest. Please forgive me, Master. Let me return the fire serpent to you now. I am unworthy of such a weapon. A fire serpent, indeed. She is an unwilling ally if she is mismatched. The mere fact that you hold her freely speaks of a partnership between weapon and wielder that is rare. Keep her for now. You will find she is both a fierce weapon and a motherly protector to those she respects. Now, please continue. I barely remember it all. I ran into your chamber. Master Kernshan was there when he should not have been. I could not think clearly, but then a warm calmness took me, because I paused to reflect on the clarity of that moment. It was then that I saw the blackness come alive above Master Kernshan's head. You were bathed in amber light. I saw a sigil of the same hue floating above your head. I felt relief. The movement in the room slowed to a standstill. Everything shimmered with vibrant color. The darts fired at us became inflated, and the smoke seemed frozen in the air. Ninza Zeta acted of her own will and directed my movements. Interesting. Can you see my sigil now? Yes, when I concentrate, but the impression is faint. It's more of a whisper now. I fear it has something to do with the sickness inside you. Master Sugar sat back in contemplation. Brother Kasai, each of us possess an inner sight that helps guide our steps and shows us the truth. Most of us are unwilling to use it, and we remain blind. I am quite baffled how you saw behind the veil so effortlessly. This ability is gained only from advanced training, which you would not have been exposed to at Ord. Also, I have never witnessed an initiate having the depth of mental control to time shift. Had I not heard your words of warning in my chamber and the subsequent outcome, I would not believe them to be true. Am I sick, Master? Sick? 
Oh, no, my boy, you are not sick. These are accomplishments few reverend grandmasters have attained over decades of study and meditation. Master Shogra chuckled. And you speak of them as if they were commonplace. What it means and how it has happened, I do not yet know. Fear crossed Kasai's face. He looked at the ancient weapon anxiously. Am I being manipulated by Ninzazita's dark magic? Is that why this has happened to me? I have no love for sorcery or the ill effects it causes those who wield it. It's unnatural. Please take the fire serpent back. I don't want it. Master Shogar thought for a moment. I have never known the Ninze Zida to grant any special abilities to its wielder outside of boosting the wielder's martial prowess. But she never accepted me as an equal partner. I shall meditate upon this and open myself to the boundless for answers. You shall do the same. The matter was decided. The two monks sat in silence for a time, lost in their thoughts. Kasai stared at the compressed Sanjikun, wondering how any of this could get any worse. He needed something else to do, anything besides meditation. You should eat something to help keep your strength up. Please rest. I'll fix us up something before we continue. After a small meal of whey bread and jerk, Kasai broke camp, and the two monks trekked deeper into the wilderness. The sounds and smell of the forest amazed Kasai. Life was abundant here, but there was also death in the air. Kasai and Master Shogar came across the carcass of a massive wild boar near the edges of a shallow stream. It had been dead for a time, but oddly enough, no other animals had come to feed on the remains. Kasai suspected he knew what had taken down the great brute. The claw marks on the boar's flesh were the same as those gouged in the trees when they first entered the forest. The safe confines of the monastery seemed so very far away. There was savage danger here. He heard a howl in the near distance. Then the forest went unnaturally silent. Kasai and Master Shogar stopped along the path and listened. What was that? Kasai whispered. He tried to gauge the proximity of the clamor. How close? Maybe a mile? He figured the predators must be following along the same path they had traveled. Kasai moved Master Shogar off the path and into the denser woods. Perhaps they could find suitable shelter or a more defensible position like a high rock or a cave. Anything besides being caught on the open trail. A deep gurgle sounded ahead of them. Kasai pushed Master Shogar off to the right. They didn't take ten steps before they heard another menacing growl coming from behind a dead tree that had been felled in a storm. A series of squeals forced Kasai to put his hands to his ears. He turned Master Shogar to go in a different direction. But again the hunters were already there, waiting. Kasai realized they were being surrounded. The Vargro had found them and were closing in for the kill. Master, there is but one way we have opened to us, but I fear this is by design, Kasai said through huffing breaths. Your instincts are right. However, we must continue to move forward. The numbers surrounding us are too many to overcome, Master Shogar said. Perhaps there is salvation ahead where there is none behind. We'll need to run. Kasai knew the confrontation was inevitable. They would not escape the Vargru. Kasai hoisted Master Shogar onto his back. He wasn't sure how fast he would be able to run or how far, but he would run until he could run no more. The wild chase began. Kasai used his peripheral vision to keep track of the Vargru on either side of him. He caught fleeting glimpses of fangs and claws, ripping up trees and throwing storms of leafy mulch into the air. Kasai's childhood nightmares came back to him in a wave of fear. He recalled his vow to protect those he loved, and this gave him renewed strength to run. He was determined not to lose another family member to creatures of darkness. But what hope did he have? The Vagru glided fast through the forest. Nothing seemed to hamper the monster's strides. Kasai had managed to avoid punches and kicks from his brothers during sparring because of his quickness. But against these mutated killers, he was too slow. Master Shogar's body jostled on his back. Every screech and wail brought the monstrosities closer. Just keep running, he thought. Don't stop. Kasai's lungs were fiery furnace filled with hot coals. His legs burned with fatigue. How much longer could he last? The Vargru charged forward. Their pounding feet shook the ground. He narrowly missed stumps, rocks, and fallen branches as he ran. When would one finally snag him and send them both to the forest floor? Just keep running. He hoped an opportunity for escape presented itself before he was spent, but he doubted it. 
the dense forest opened to a small meadow surrounded by sheer cliffs on three sides. The environment would be considered idyllic under different circumstances, because I knew they were trapped. Two Vagra erupted out of the woods a moment later. Each sprinted to either side of Kasai and forced him to run straight. They were as large as the bears of the deep forest. Their fur was patterned like camouflaged cats, and stunted antlers grew down their backs. Their heads tapered into the canine snouts of wolves. Steep rock walls glowered down at Kasai, and hope left him. There was no escape. He slowed down since there was no sense wasting any more of his strength. The Vagru mirrored his steps. Each had five pink eyes that rolled in enlarged milky clouds, but they did not attack. Kai's legs trembled from exhaustion and threatened to buckle beneath him. Master Sugar set himself on the ground. Kasai knew their only option was to climb the rock wall. Maybe alone he could scale the rock face fast enough to escape, but that was a big maybe. I won't leave Master Sugar, he thought. Somewhere in the back of his mind he heard Daku laughing. Master, our path ends here. There is nowhere to go but up the rock wall, Kasai said. He frantically looked for an alternative escape route, but he saw none. We will need to fight. Clever beasts, Master Sugar said. He extended his hands and rotated his body as if to discern the locations of the Vagru. I will deal with these abominations. Get to the Temple of Illumination in Gethm. Find Grand Master Musulu. Tell him what had happened at Ordu. Master Sugar stepped forward to draw the attention of the two Vagru. Why are you waiting? Climb the wall now! Three more Vagru bounded out of the forest, and lastly, one great beast entered the meadow. Its body was covered in twigs and loose debris. The Alpha Vagru bellowed out a high-pitched shortle to its packmates, and they responded with submissive chirps. The three Vagru slowed to a leisurely pace and spread out. Their prey had nowhere to go. Asai looked up the rock wall and then back to his master. Master Sugar breathed in deeply and readied himself in a defensive position. But in truth, the assassin's poison had sapped too much of the master's strength. He was sacrificing himself to give Kasai time to escape. Kasai grabbed Ninza Zida from his sash. No, master, we shall face this trial together, as one with the boundless at our side. He thought he caught a satisfied smile from Master Sugar's mouth before more coughing brought blood instead. Kasai would fight for as long as he could. He hoped his master would be proud of him, but he held none for victory. They were too many of the enormous creatures. All of Kasai's training was predicated on stopping the fight once his opponent offered submission. But this was different. Kasai could almost feel the primordial hunger from the Vagru wash over him like a wave of aggression. Fear traveled through his body and knotted in his muscles. His heart pounded in his chest, and his limbs grew weak. As if sensing weakness, the two side Vagru charged directly at him and lunged with splayed claws and gnashing teeth. One of Ninza Zida's end segments flashed out with astonishing speed. It cracked against the skull of the first Vagru. Then, without hesitation, Kasai's body twisted so he could stab the butt end of its other end segment into the eye of the second. Both Vagru drew back a few steps. Kasai was amazed at the quickness of his attacks. Ninsis Zida hummed in his hands. It was as if the Zanjigan moved of its own volition and made his body follow. It created a protective barrier around him, then whipped out fast as a viper whenever a Vagru came within range. Kasai felt a flash of hope, but then realized the Vagru had succeeded in widening the distance between him and Master Sugar. Master Sugar had engaged the other three Vagru. Somehow he had regained some strength and was keeping the pack of unnatural horrors at bay. The master's movements were fluid and effortless. He redirected the force of each attack away from himself, sometimes sending the frustrated beast headlong into the ground. Kasai stared in awe. Ninza Zida burned hot in his hands. Kasai stupidly looked at the weapon in surprise. He realized too late the sensation was a warning. White light filled his sight. The shock of the blow was like no other he had ever felt. Kasai was bent in half as his feet left the ground. A sharp pressure built in his side. Broken ribs. How many, he did not know. The air left his lungs as he hit the ground. The pain was excruciating. He knew that was it when a tall shape blocked out the light of the sun. He shut his eyes and waited for the sharp bite of the Vargru to finish him. Kasai! Kasai! Master Sugar said. Stand if you can! 
Master Shilver stood over him. His hands glowed white hot. Kasai clenched his teeth to the pain. He held Ninza's Zeta loosely in his hands and stood. Breathing was difficult. The Vargro did not wait to pounce. The one closest to Kasai lunged in the air like a cannonball shot. Kasai's arms thrust forward with the staff to intercept. The sections of the Ninza's Zeta miraculously lined together in a rigid fraud. The impact of the strike shook Kasai's arms and left them tingling up through his shoulders. The Vargru fell, but slowly regained its feet. It shook its head like a dog in the rain. Kasai struck again, but missed his mark. He was no match for these unnatural predators. Fear clouded his thinking and slowed his responses. Daku was right. He had never learned to do what was necessary to win. He always held back against his brothers at Ordu. He never struck the killing blow. Ninsa's Zeta changed back into three sections. Kasai spun the staff in such a way so that the outer parts created a broader, figure-eight pattern pinwheel. Master Shogar was not faring any better, as the Vargru attacked from multiple directions at once. Master Shogar cried out in pain. Kasai spared a glance and saw that the old monk had fallen to his knees. Master Shogar tried to stand, but a second Vargru shouldered into him, bowling him over. In a heartbeat, the third Vargru had him pinned to the ground. The other two circled to enjoy the kill. Kasai tried desperately to get back to his master's side. He struck out widely at the nearest Vargru. It dodged his blows and snapped at his legs. The other Vargru jumped to the rock wall and climbed. The beast leaped into the air, intent on attacking Kasai from above. Kasai saw the threat, but was in no position to defend himself. He braced himself for the impact. Three bolts of blue energy slammed into the Vargru's side. Kasai almost stumbled in surprise. The shots were not enough to kill the creature, but knocked it to the ground near his feet. Kasai wasted no time. He compressed in Zizida into one hand and used the sections as a bludgeon. He hit the back of the Vargru's head as hard as he could. The Vargru's skull cracked. Kasai looked to see who or what had saved him. A lone figure entered the meadow from the far right. She walked with the gait of a young woman. She was dressed in the colors of the forest and wore tight-fitted leathers with a hooded frock. She fired more blue bolts into the back of one of the Vargru closest to Master Sugar. Kasai took advantage of the distraction. He struck the Vargru pinning Master Sugar. Ninza Zeta flared with heat as the two outer sections repeatedly bashed and battered the monster's side. The Vargru lunged at Kasai and swiped his legs with one of its massive paws. Kasai fell back to the ground. The Vargru pressed the attack. Kasai backpedaled like a crab. Then he kicked his legs up and over his body. He pushed off the ground with his hands, holding tight to Ninza Zeta's middle segment. He arched backward and landed in a standing position. The acrobatic movement momentarily transfixed the Vargru. Kasai drove the end segment of the staff down the Vargru's throat. Ninza Zeta blazed with bright light. The Vargru's eyes bulged as the end of the staff punctured through its neck. A warmth rushed up Kasai's arms and he felt an odd sensation of gratitude. Kasai looked at the three-section staff with amazement and no small amount of trepidation. Kasai wondered if the cursed staff was relishing the kill. The Vargru's mutated body collapsed to the ground, with only its head remaining upright. Kasai pulled Ninza Zeed out of the monster's mouth. He dared for a moment to check on Master Sugar. Unbelievably, the old man was slowly raising himself off the ground. The Alpha Vargru barked out a series of high-pitched screeches. The Vargru hovering around Master Sugar scattered and regrouped. The three younger Vargru raced toward the woman. Two ran straight at her, while the third circled to attack from the side. The Alpha held back, waiting like an experienced general surveying the battlefield. The woman went straight for the Vargru. Her movement was more of a spiraling dance rather than a sprint. She moved her arms in rhythmic gestures while she twirled through the air. Kasai saw strange, autumn-colored runes trailing from her hands. The magic rose higher and twisted in the air behind her head. She acted as if she didn't care about the danger closing in on her. She spread her arms wide, keeping her palms down over the grassy field. The grass beneath her and the speeding Vargru trembled and convulsed. Both Vargru leaped into the air. In the same moment, the living earth erupted between them, morphing into the shape of giant humanoid, dirt, Grass and flowers covered his outer skin. Thick roots spiraled together, then overlapped to make up its arms and legs. Branches and leaves sprouted from all directions across its vast bulk. 
The earth golem snatched one of the Vagra from the air with an enormous hand. It snapped its neck with a quick flex. The golem then twisted its body with incredible speed and caught the second Vagra by its hind legs and hurled it across the field. The Vagra somersaulted awkwardly through the air and landed hard with a loud crack. The golem turned to the Alpha, while still holding the first Vagra tightly by its neck. The Alpha moved forward slowly, sniffing the air and assessing the golem's strength. The golem let the dead Vagra fall from his hand. The Alpha snorted in some form of animalistic disgust. The arrival of the newcomers had stolen its advantage, and it called to its remaining pack-mate. The runt scurried to its leader and both bolted into the forest. Kasai breathed out a long sigh of relief. He saw the woman communicating with the earth golem. Both looked at Kasai's direction. It seemed they were deciding his fate. The woman approached. Kasai's mind screamed out in warning. Wood witch! She was coming for them, probably to take as slaves or boil in a stew. He raced Nensa Zeta in defense. That's close enough. What do you want? Kasai said. His ribs felt like they were moving on their own. He slumped to one side. The golem roared. The rumble of its earthly voice vibrated through Kasai. The woman put her hand on the golem. That's enough, Galdemur. Don't mind him. He can be a bit of a bully sometimes, she said. Are you hurt? Kasai was surprised by the softness of her voice. We are fine. We do not need your help. Kasai, it will be all right, Master Shoker said. He was finally up. He put a reassuring hand on Kasai's shoulder. I do not believe the forest dweller means us any harm. Listen to him, Galdi. Not even a thank you, the woman said over her shoulder to her giant creation. Of course we don't mean you any harm, old monk. You were lucky I happened along as I did. Kasai refused to lower Ninza's Zeta. The fire serpent sections glowed dull mauve. He had no trust of forest dwellers and their mysterious ways. Kasai felt Master Shoger's hand slide off his shoulder. The old monk had dropped to the ground. Come now, boy. I can see your father is not well. Let me have a look at him. The woman took a few steps toward Master Shoger. Stay back. Do not touch him. Galdemore growled menacingly. Galdi, hush. It's Kasai, right? I'm Desdemonia, and that big mud pie is Galdemore. Kasai, listen. Your father is hurt. I can help him. If I do anything unnatural, then you're free to strike me with your pretty sticks, okay? The woman took away the hood and revealed her young face. Black locks of thick hair cascaded down her back. Do we have a deal? Kasai didn't say anything, but didn't prevent her from moving closer to Master Shogar either. Desdemonia waved her hands over the prone monk's body. Kasai smelled lavender and blueberries as a soft bluish glow lapped against her palms. She gently touched Shogar, and the flames caressed his body as well. Galdi, help me roll him over, Desdemonia said. She examined him thoroughly and found the source of his sickness. Oh, that's a nasty sting. She uttered strange words and brought her hand down over Master Shogar's wound. The soft bluish flame turned black. What are you doing? Kasai said anxiously. Shh, Desdemonia whispered sternly. Why? Pus oozed from the wound, and then it closed shut. Desdemonia selected some reddish herbs from a small pouch on her thigh and crushed them on a nearby rock. She collected the pulped pieces in her hand, spit on them, and then squeezed her palm tight. Again, the soft blue flame engulfed her hand, and the floral smell of berries wafted through the air. She put the paste on the closed wound and bound it to his body with sticky leaves from a different pouch. Desdemonia looked up at Kasai with kind eyes as dark as coal. See, that wasn't so terrible, she said. The wound is closed for now. He will feel some strength return, but he needs rest. Whatever is infecting him is beyond my cure craft. Now, let's have a look at you. The seriousness had left her face and a pleasant smile took its place. Kasai looked at Desdemonia both awe and suspicion. You are a... That was Elmenati magic, he said. He took a step backward with a frown. I can see by that unfavorable expression you do not approve, Desdemonia said. She had the apathetic tone of one who had endured this conversation too many times before. Her hands rested on her hips. I told you, Gaudi, 
another day in paradise. You made that, Kasai said. He took another step backward. His ribs screamed in agony. He scrunched to one side to lessen the pain. It didn't work. Yes, I called upon the ancient pacts between the Earth Goddess and First Dwellers to raise Galdemore. And now the only thing saving your father is the healing power of the forest. She spoke in a melodic, richly accented voice. Kasai couldn't place it. Perhaps she was from a jungle tribe in Sunna. How she had managed to pass the Sariba Mountains was a riddle. He looked upon his rescuer with new eyes, and his pulse quickened. She was beautiful. Her clothes were form-fitting, as befitted the traditional attire of a forest dweller. They were made of a flexible material that allowed her to move silently past trees and bush with nothing loose to snap a branch or give away her position. Bands of deer hide crisscrossed her legs and wound up her torso, keeping the material snug to her body. Charms and thin pouches were woven into the straps for ease of access. Her outer garment was sleeveless and revealed arms with the muscular definition of one who was trained to defend herself. Bestimonia's eyes briefly caught the light of the rising sun. The color shifted from dark charcoal to smoldering amber. Kasai had never seen eyes so bright before. He was mesmerized by their inner fire. He stared at her, dumbfounded. The pain in his sight was forgotten. Her slender but still feminine shape stirred a queer feeling in his gut. He was unsure why his heart thumped against the walls of his chest. He tried to say something to break the silence, but his mouth was bone dry. It wasn't as if he had never seen a woman before. While at the monastery, he had studied numerous anatomical diagrams of both men and women. The images showed meridian lines and primary energy zones, as well as pressure points and vulnerable nerve clusters. All of that was forgotten as he looked upon the supple and sinuous figure of Desdemonia. He saw strength in her body as well as a feminine allure. Kasai noted the marks of old scars that traveled up her forearms. She was a fighter and a healer, just like the monks of Ordu. Desdemonia was no village damsel lost in the woods. She was a daughter of the forest who was one with the wilderness. Somehow that made him nervous. Kasai stared at Desdemonia's comely yet bewitching face. A golden gaze drew him in for a second time, and he was spellbound by her smart, bright eyes, eyes that demanded his attention and made him uncomfortable. She smiled at him, and his insides leaped. Something to say? Desdemonia said with a raised eyebrow. The wind shifted and pulled at her long raven locks. Thick strands of hair swam before her amber eyes and cast them back into shadow. The pain in his sigh returned and snapped him out of his reverie. You are a witch, then? Kasai said, not knowing what else to say. He quickly added, and it's not my father. My father's dead and gone. Eighteen. Shiverick. Duke Shiverig leaned back against a wooden chair at his desk and read from an oversized book. The worn leather cover felt good in his hands. It was old and familiar. The book was filled with the historical events of the Shiverig clan, dating back to when the first Aikahun Barok Shiverig led his burly, pale-skinned warriors across the Eastern Ocean. They arrived on sleek wooden ships, trimmed with sails and oar, and intent on conquest. It was Baroque Shiverig's vision to tame the wilds of the new land and bring its native people to heal under his reign. The Aikahun ruled with absolute power and imposed his will with sword and spear. He conquered all that dwelled in the hills and forests, between the cold and jagged hoarfrost mountains to the north and the tall peaks of the Sarabi Mountains to the south. Duke Shiverig turned another page. A crude diagram extended over two pages of what was now known as the Kingdom of Barokia. The able-bodied men of the Middle Lands were conscripted into his war band, and soon the war band became an army. The women and children were used as slave labor to service his war machine or tend to the farmlands, ensuring the harvest came in to feed his warriors. Shiverick traced the borders of Barokia, then extended his path into the kingdoms of Sunne and Trosk, he exhaled in frustration. The pages of my life will not be meaningless. Barokia must grow. 
he said. He turned another page. Gangs of ogre were discovered in the deep forest and initially thought to be perfect fighters due to their size and strength. This notion fell out of favor when the great brutes were assimilated into the army. The body of an ogre was ripe for war, but their bloodlust and lack of discipline made them a liability in battle. The results were catastrophic, and most were slaughtered or used in the slave pits for sport. Yaikahun's rule remained uncontested for decades. His army swelled over the long years to vast numbers and were filled with colossal soldiers that defied understanding. Rumors spread that the great conqueror and his scions had intermingled their bloodline with that of the ogre slaves. It was pure speculation, and any who spoke out against a newly appointed King Shiverig were rarely heard from again. New bloodlines were introduced into the population, and over time the size and stature of the army normalized. Yet the Shiverig scions remained as giants amongst men. Better times, Shiverick said. He closed the book and placed it on the desk. He stood, feeling quietly agitated, as if he wanted to be in several places at once. He abruptly left his study. Things were taking too long. He reached the sparring chamber. Twenty of his elite soldiers were already in the room. Shiverick was taller than most men, with a perfectly proportioned physique. His broad shoulders and thick legs supported the massive slabs of packed muscle across his frame. He moved with the grace and skill of a mountain cat. Practice swords and shields clashed together. The clatter of a disarmed weapon hit the stone floor and skidded to his feet. Shiverick picked it up and walked to the central mat. He stood barefoot, wearing loose pants and a thin shirt. His men, however, wore padded armor consisting of quilted layers of cloth and batting. He drew in a breath to center himself. Begin, he said. His opponents came at him one by one or many at a time. It didn't matter. Garen Shiverig was a brute. He never held back, always being the aggressor. He rained vicious blows down on his opponents with the sword or his bare hands. His soldiers were systematically dispatched and sent sprawling to the floor. He had already laid low a dozen men when Sestra sauntered into the room. She wore soft leather boots and leggings. The vest she wore, loosely tied in the front, barely contained her alabaster flesh. She propped herself up against the weapons rack. I see the steward has finally found her something appropriate to wear, Shivrick said. He was not thrilled to see her here. He knew his men would quickly fall under her seductive spell. They were useless to him if they were distracted. Their efficiency and training would diminish, and he had barely worked up a sweat. Clothing is such a bother, yet Sestra still obeys her master, the succubus said with a crooked smile. Seems the mighty Duke Shiverick does not have much of a challenge this day. She picked up a blunt dagger and twirled it in the middle of her palm. Perhaps I should call Kalkaroth for playtime. He would be happy to oblige you. Call your pet abomination, then. I could use a good brawl, Shiverick said. In truth, he wanted to know more about how demons fought. Their outer strength was apparent enough, but was that magically enhanced? And how did they fare without the use of deadly poison? He would need to consult with his mages, and possibly have them create a charm for him for both scenarios. Sestra pouted. She threw the blunt dagger fast into a dummy target. The blade struck what would have been the heart of a real man. It managed to stay embedded in the practice doll. The succubus sashayed up to Shiverick. She reached out and wiped a bead of sweat from the side of his rough face. And here I thought you would ask me to dance. Sestra gave him another pout while her tail twitched seductively in the air. She backed away with outstretched arms. As you can see, I am now unarmed. The Duke's men collected in a ring around the two. Most were rubbing bruises or sore muscles, while some stared helplessly at the succubus. The challenge had been declared, that much was clear. They waited eagerly for the duke to respond. Shivrig decided a tussle with a succubus could work to his advantage, and it would be a good lesson for his men. They all needed to understand their uncommon allies' strengths and weaknesses. He walked away from Sestra and placed his practice sword on the weapons rack. I am unarmed as well. But how do I know you do not come here bearing your mistress's gifts? You don't. 
But be at ease. The mistress has not informed me of any recent slights from Gethem or its duke. This bout is purely for my pleasure. Grappling only, Shivrick said. Until submission, Sestra purred. Then let us dance. Shivrick took a fighter's stance and waved Sestra forward. He remained in the center of the sparring mat while she rounded his position. A lithe figure was like a child compared to his massive build. She looked at him in admiration and awe, but that was just a feint. He had observed her in the battle against Grandmaster Nusulu. She was a handful, but how deadly was she without the aid of poison or magic? That was what he intended to discover. Sestra launched herself at Shiverick with a kick to his midsection. The duke caught the blow in both hands with ease. He knew something more was coming, and was ready when she twisted out of his grip and swept her tail across his calves. His sturdy legs withstood the impact of the blow. His men cheered. I like a man with strong legs. She gave him a playful wink. Shiverick moved fast to counterstrike. He grabbed Sestra's right arm and twisted it around her back. She arched backward and laid her head against the duke's chest. An enticing position, she said. Her free hand playfully traveled up his left leg. The duke pivoted and shot his knee out and down to the backside of Sestra's right leg. The move forced her to the mat. Shivrig followed her down. Sestra folded with the momentum and twisted the two into roll before hitting the floor. The duke found himself on his back with Sestra's backside lying over him. He involuntarily became aroused with the weight of her body draped over his... My, 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 you are full of surprises, Sestra purred. Don't give in to her tricks. She's just trying to confuse you into making a mistake, he thought. She twisted out of his arm lock and twirled to mount his chest. A crooked smile returned. Shiverick grabbed the loose fabric of Sestra's vest from behind her back and pulled. The suck of a somersaulted acrobatically through the air and landed in a standing position. Shiverick drew his legs back and leaped to his feet. Shivering rushed Sestra. She jumped into the air to avoid his tackle. He caught her by one leg and slammed her back to the floor. He pounced upon her, grabbed her wrists above her head, and held her arms down by his knees. His men cheered again, but he knew the succubus was toying with him. She was making this too easy and enjoying the sexual provocation of her actions. Shall I submit here, or would you like to continue this in private? Trust me, I don't mind being watched. Sestra spoke loud enough for all to hear. Her tail twitched in the air behind him. A page cleared his throat. Um, my apologies, my lord Shiverick. I have news for the city of Spires. Shiverick swiveled his head to see a page standing in the doorway. His spies had returned. The outcome of this bout could wait. He released Sestra and hurried from the sparring chamber. Summon Malachi. I'll want his input, Shiverick said to the page. Who's next? Shivrig heard the succubus say as he left the room. Shivrig went directly to his strategy room. It was perched at the top of a high tower within the main castle walls. A sturdy table sat central to the chamber, with a sheaf of paper, an inkwell with a pen for written decrees, but no chairs. The duke preferred to stand while deciding the fates of those who fell under his rule. He owed them that much respect. Ten arched windows spiraled around the inner wall. Shivering appreciated the cleanliness of natural light instead of candles or torches. Somehow it made him feel pure. The city stretched out beneath him. Gethem was the first walled encampment that grew into a town and then into a thriving city. It was the hub of commerce for Barokia. Ports filled the coastline of Gethem, and ships from the three kingdoms and beyond came and went, bringing unique wares to be sold or traded in the markets. Gethem was also a dirty place. The city streets were filled with less than savory folk, but honest in their conviction of their heritage. The citizens of Gethem were a proud lot. Each could trace their lineage back to a family name from the original conquerors. Therefore, they did not take well to foreigners. For all its faults, Shivrig knew his city had a strong backbone. Its citizens followed the will of their duke without question. In his mind, Gethem should have remained as the capital city of Barukia, but the decision was made to move the capital to Kwakal when House Conrad took power. 
Which wealthy noble wanted to be reminded of the hardships their labors suffered from working in their factories or fields, when the city of Spires offered posh apartments with views of rolling hills and forests? Living in the grime of industry was not to the taste of the nobles. And why should they need to care about the suffering of others if their coffers remained filled with gold and silver coins? They're all soft, Shiverick said. The image of overflowing coffers reminded him of House Conrad's treachery. The nobles had so easily been manipulated for the promise of Conrad gold. Demogris and his wayward spell! A storm of passion swirled in Shiverick's heart. He turned from the window of the strategy room as Malachi entered with a stocky man named Pathias. Shiverick had been waiting for weeks for a reliable report from Quakal. He was concerned about the lack of information flowing to him. What news, Pathias? Be direct, Shiverick said without pleasantries. King Conrad has decreed Barokia will take up arms against the North. He will soon call upon the four great houses to bring their respective portions of the five armies together in Quakal. The individual armies will be dismantled and consolidated into the newly named King's Army. The King will bestow a temporary title of Second General to you, Lord Fritta, and Duke Manda. He will then divide up the armed forces into new legions and grant leadership as he sees fit. Rumors fly that Baron Rokig will be named First General of the King's Army. He will be assigned 10,000 men, mostly coming from the Standing Army of Gatham. I have heard he will order them north and east to secure the outer territories. It is uncertain what roles you and the remaining lords will play. Of course, Baron Roke, the king's lackey. I would expect no less from that spineless sycophant. Continue, Shiverick said in a calm tone. Yet internally the storm in his heart raged with new fury. Each lord will retain a token host at their keep, enforcing the king's law. Although King Conrad will soon demand the presence of the Knights of Getham in the capital city to bolster his personal security, Pathias bowed. His report had ended. Why now? What has happened to change the king's stance of Malgris in the north? Shiverick's mind raced to potential betrayals and those that might benefit as House Shiverick grew weaker. That is all I presently know, my duke, Pathias said and bowed once more. The duke paced the hard floor of the circular chamber. He would dismantle my standing army and spread my troops across Barokia. It is a bold move, and one I would not expect Conrad to make on his own. Shiverick pondered for a moment. Who is advising the king? He knows I will not surrender my troops as willingly as Baron Rokig. Malachi walked to a window with his hands clasped behind his back. This is precisely why he does it. The king will force you to play your hand for power, but on his terms. He gathers the kingdom's armies to him, in case you strike, Malachi said. If you agree to his demands, he will bleed your strength slowly. House of Shiverick will become a frail husk of its former glory, a memory to be scattered in the wind. Spare me poetry, Malachi. It's exactly what I would have done to him if I had the favor of the other great houses. But why now? My duke, you have been rather verbose with your ill will toward the rule of House Conrad of late, Malachi said. He raised his eyebrows as if this was an obvious statement. He's scared, Shiverick said. He needs something to solidify his rule. A war would unite the other great house to a common cause and drag the lesser houses in through intimidation and pressure. Sestra walked into the strategy room uninvited and cosied up to Shiverick. Your men bore me. They break too easily. She winked seductively at Malachi as her hands massaged Shiverick's strong arms. The Duke ignored the remark. He peeled her body off his as if he were removing the slick membrane of a sticky fruit. He was not in the mood for her games. The timing is not quite right to crush Conrad. I have enough men in key positions within the noble houses, but not enough to sway the balance of power. I cannot strike without the alliance of either Duke Manda or Lord Fritta. I need their men if I wish to hold the throne. Shivering paced across the small chamber. I could promise Duke Manda the baron's lands and its holdings in return for his assistance. It might be enough to sway him. There is no love lost between the two, and he would become the second richest house in Barokia.
Lord Frit uh, has always been a wild card. I'm not sure where his alliance lies. House Fritta will watch and wait. Of the two, I trust and respect Fritta more. He honors tradition. The Duke turned to Pathias. I need to know when Conrad will move his troops against Malgris. Get me the routes of supply lines he intends to run. Have the heavy war engines been mobilized outside the city gates yet? What numbers will he keep in reserve behind the city walls? Speak to your brethren inside the walls of Lords Fritas and Duke Manda's keeps. See if either will acquiesce to the king's demands or resist. I suspect Duke Manda will go along willingly with the king. His ambitions go no further than the easiest way to fill his coffers with more gold. He will surely finance the war effort, and therefore will follow whatever the king wishes. Also, have your shadow men keep their eyes and ears open for dissenters against our house in Gethim. I want names and family connections. Yes, my duke, it shall be done. Pathias bowed one last time and departed the chamber. Sestra moved in front of the duke. Tread lightly, Duke Shivering. Now is not the time for heroics and hurt pride. The flow of Maugris's plans must not be interrupted. It would not end well for you to change the outcome of his war. I care not for the mad one's desires, Shivering said. He took a step to the side of Sestra. I cannot allow Conrad to continue on this course. Then let me say it a different way. My mistress would be most displeased if you altered the events now set in motion. There are other moving pieces whose success or failure depends on the completion of your tasks. Sestra moved back in front of Shivrik to make sure he fully understood her message. Are you threatening me? Shivrik's outward calm demeanor had evaporated. She stood her ground against his fury, which caused his desire for her to increase. He wanted to break her. I am merely stating the obvious consequential events. Sestra's alluring stare had him captivated. Shivery could not look away. My lord, perhaps we have overlooked an interesting partnership. The influence of the demigod of change has brought about a new radical faction called the Cult of Shukre. They follow the teachings of Moor and are rising in prominence in the outer cities and villages, Malachi said. The time of war grows near. It is time to bring your pieces of power to their proper places on the board, Malachi said. The cult of Shuke would be a valuable tool to create unrest from within Quakal and the outer townships. Their influence could have a profound effect on the nobles backing the king. Shivrig turned his head toward Malachi as if hearing him for the first time. Sestra grabbed his chin and forced him to look back into her purple eyes. You must commit now to the higher ideals of the Ice Queen, or choose to be fodder for Lord Osiax's demon horde, and I wouldn't want the latter for my dear duke. She pressed close to Shivery. The Frost Legion shall soon arrive, and the frigid tide will flow. The Shivery clan tamed these lands, and I shall not dishonor my ancestors any longer. The rule of this false king must end. I am the strength and might of the land, not House Conrad. He pressed his finger down on Sestra's forehead. How could you understand such a thing as honor, demon? It is the same in the abyss. Although honor is a misplaced word, power is a more appropriate description among the infernal planes, and physical strength is hardly the only metric of power. Cunning and deception are just as important to get what you want. Shivrig felt the pliable form of Sestra's body press forcefully against his. Her figure melted around his body as her arms and hands wandered up his spine. His desire for her rose, and his body responded. Shivrig saw Sestra in a new way. The succubus was wise, and she wanted only to serve her master. He could almost taste her desire on his lips. Sestra, you have a valid point. Shivrig turned his head to Malachi. Send a squad of loyal knights to Quakal as an honor guard for the king. Make sure they keep me informed. Shivrig looked back to Sestra. He returned her embrace, much to his surprise. His eyes devoured the succubus while his mind played through different ways to possess her. She looked up at him, longing for the attention his body promised. Are you done playing the despairish son of a twice-dead king? We have unfinished business together.
Sestra climbed up Shiverick's chest and kissed him hard. She bit down on his bottom lip and drew blood. You do enjoy tormenting my arch regime, Shiverick said when he pulled away from her kiss. He wiped a few drops of fresh blood from his mouth. He lifted Sestra's vest over her head and dropped it to the floor. The afternoon sunlight lit her alabaster flesh in warm hues. Shiverick devoured her breasts. He barely noticed when she removed his pants or when she removed her own. The duke swept the contents of the table to the floor. Her legs dangled over the edge when he mounted her. Sestra's nails dug into his back and bit deeply into his shoulder. She bucked under his weight and drove him deeper between her legs as he climaxed. Ecstasy filled his body as he filled her with his seed. It was soon over. Shiverick fumbled to collect his clothing. His thoughts were jumbled and hazy as he dressed. Sestra slid off the table with a cunning smile on her lips. I see before me a lordly duke among the immortals of Gothels. There is strength in you, Garen Shiverick. But first, you must bow to the rule of Malgris and the mistress. Do this, and great power awaits you. The three kingdoms of Hanna is only the beginning. Shivrick's vision spun. He heard himself talking, but wasn't sure of what he was saying. There is wisdom in your words, Sestra. I will honor my arrangement with the North. I will not alter Malgris's timetable. He sounded like a drunken cur. The room seemed to shift with each step he took. I am glad you have come to your senses, my duke. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an orange-robed fly to catch. Sestra blew Malachi kiss and strolled lightly out of the room. She didn't bother to dress. The effects of rutting with Sestra wore off soon after she departed. His mind cleared. I'll play your game for now, Succubus. Shivrig knew wars left armies weak and depleted, no matter the victor. He would hold back his elite forces and use the rest sparingly until he was assured of one side's victory over the other. He would honor his ancestors before all others and ensure that the ultimate rule of Barokia remained with House Shivrig. Threats and false promises did not concern 